Okay, we are live, right? Yep. Bismillah. Bismillah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good night, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, today is the 8th of February, 2023 the 17th of Rajab, and we are 42 days away from the holy month of Ramadan, mashallah. So tonight is the premiere of our conversation with being pioneers, alhamdulillah, this is series two. So last year, uh, Bambar started um, a series of conversations that we had with pioneers. A lot of them are, are our parents, mashallah. And we sit down and we talk to them about their life, how life was, uh, pre-Islam, during their conversion, during their life, um, just to get uh, advice and experience about, uh, I mean, sorry, advice about their experience, mashallah. So alhamdulillah, my name is uh, Mukhtara. And for those who don't know who I am, I am the founder of Bambar, which is Black American Muslims Born and Raised. And um, we basically are a group of uh, Muslims who come together. We talk about our experiences, how we were raised growing up. Uh, Muslim here in America, alhamdulillah, and we have our co-host, Hadia. <laughs> Sound like um, <laughs> she's been with our group since the day one, mashallah. She's a day one, <laughs> alhamdulillah. And we have our guest, um, Sister Tahira Abdullah, mashallah. Sound like um, alhamdulillah. I cannot wait to hear about some Sister Tahira. Sister Tahira has been trying to uh, come on Van Bars uh, and tell us her story for about two years now. <laughs> so I am excited to hear from you about your life, about your experience. And I pray that everybody that is tuning in now will benefit from um, your life, inshallah. So without further delay, because we have a lot to get into tonight, uh, we're going to have Hadia read uh, Sister Tahir's intro and show. All right. Bismillah. Introducing the Grand Umi. Mm -hmm. Sister Tahira Abdullah from Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a native, has been Muslim for over 45 years. Alhamdulillah. She took her shahada in Philadelphia and was a part of very few movements, such as the Darul Islam movement and the Islamic Party of North America. That's just to name a few. She has lived in multiple communities throughout the East Coast, the Midwest, the South, and Saudi Arabia. She holds an associate degree in business administration. The Grand Umi is big on education. There hasn't been a community that she's been a part of that she hasn't taught either Islamic studies or Arabic. She is currently teaching three different classes to children, young adults, and encourages the old heads to continue to learn Arabic despite any challenges they have. She has spoken as a guest speaker at different women's conferences on the East Coast. Sister Tahira also worked in the medical field for many years. She has six children, 15 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. She enjoys learning, swimming, walking, and engaging with the youth. Alhamdulillah. Please welcome Sister Tahira. Alhamdulillah. First of all, we have to acknowledge our Lord and, and uh, our Prophet. So I'm going to say, uh, and I say that primarily because we don't want shaitan in nothing that we do. And the only way that happens is if we remember Allah and he remembers us. So if at any point in your life or any part, part of this conversation that we're having, you have a sense of shaitan being around, just say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim And he scrumbles away, he goes away. So this is real. We are in real time now and we are always real because we are always in the presence of Allah. And as long as we know that, and long as we live that kind of life that we know he's always here, we will be as respectable as we can be. And we will be the kind of people that hopefully 
Allah loves, because that's our goal, to be of the people that Allah loves. Okay, and then we have to always, when we have a, a gathering, give salutations to the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the last messenger, and we are um, on his watch. His mission is our mission, and we have to always realize that and know that in our life, that we're not here for us. We're not here to just enjoy the life. We are here to fulfill our mission, the same mission of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then some praise to Allah, subhanAllah, walhamdulillahi, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And then we join that in that praise, that's tasbih. This is the food of the angels. So not only are we among uh, humans, we are among everything in the universe because everything in the universe is part of the hamd, the praise of Allah. This is our reality and we have to fall, stay really strong in that especially as we approach Ramadan. Okay, now we're going to get to the nitty gritty, alhamdulillah. All right, the sister asked me some things, a whole lot of stuff, and I, I don't know if I can remember it tonight or not, all the stuff I talked to that young sister about, <laughs> but she wanted to know about my very beginnings, and my very beginnings came from um, the Baptist church. You know, that's where my parents uh, finally took me to because the first church I saw, I said, oh, mama, what's that? Look at that pretty building. And she didn't say much. So when we got home, I had to put the pieces together later in my life that um, she was embarrassed that she had never taken me to a church. So uh, the next thing I knew, well, she took me to the side and that was always her strategy. Take, take me to the side, get close to me. And she would say, you know, baby, church is in your heart. I said, church is in my heart? She said, yeah, church is in your heart. That was the most liberating thing I think anybody ever said to me in my lifetime, because I had a reference. If a church, a place of worship was in your heart, not in the building. And I got caught up into the building. She, had, she would say little things, but it would be great things that would shape my understanding to Islam. So that's how I attended church. When I went to the church, I was with the people, I sang with the people and anybody know about the Baptist, you had a good time in there. The music was nice, but at any rate, alhamdulillah, uh, I kept moving. I learned some good values from the church because they taught us how to make money. You know, those sisters would get in that kitchen and they would cook up those meals and they would get that money that they needed for the building fund, you know, or for whatever else they were trying to get together and do. And uh, I saw their ethic, eth, eth, mm, say it for me, somebody. Ethnic. Oh, there you go, baby. Work that's ethic. Classroom. Yeah, that's classroom stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, alhamdulillah, I saw those sisters as workers. And of course that, it's one of the patterns that I always knew that we could make money. Whatever we wanted, we could do it. Get in that kitchen, make those dinners. They're going to buy those dinners and we're going to make money. So I saw before I left the church, I did see that big, beautiful church that was finally bought. So I saw it from the beginning to the end and I knew things were possible. Uh, it was possible for us to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us a little bit about your family structure growing up. Family structure, alhamdulillah, I had the daddy who sat on the right hand of the uh, right side of the table, and I had uh, brothers and sisters that sat around, and a mother that all while we were eating was getting up, looking at our plates, and putting that extra little bit of potato salad in the place that was empty. That's what I saw in my house. My mother was uh, just fantastic, you know. Uh, my father was there, so, and he... He was the one who provided me with a love of me. I, you know, I didn't realize until later, but anyway, when my father looked at my face, I would see a, his face change and I would see him looking at me like I was the only precious jewel on this universe. That's what I got from my father's face when he looked at me. So I mean, when I went to school, I was all happy happy go lucky having a good time and then this girl had to let me know about something that I did not know and she said with a frown on her face you old black thing 
of course that didn't touch me because <laughs> it's because my daddy had already put the love of me in me because of the way he just looked at me. So I'm wondering, I don't know what's going on with this lady. But at any rate, so I would get little signals like that, you know, that, uh, and then later on, I realized that whatever people thought beauty was, it wasn't me. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. So people don't think I'm beautiful. And then I just entertained that for one, I guess a half of a second. And I went back to my daddy's face. And that's where I've always been, in my daddy's face. So alhamdulillah, I didn't have the problems that a lot of ladies went through that were uh, smart and talented and all those other kinds of things because what Allah gave me through my dad was what helped me. So I'm saying to you all in the relationships between the girls and the fathers, it is, it is paramount. It has to be that love that comes from, you got your mama's there, we know mama's there. But the thing between that girl and his, the father is so, so, so necessary, you know. So I was a daddy girl and uh, I stayed that way for a long time. Alhamdulillah. So my brothers and sisters, they were, both were older. One brother, one sister, both were older than me. So my mother put it, and she was from the South. So she put in us that you have to respect your oldest brother. You have to respect him. He's in charge. When I leave, he's in charge. So I learned respect and, and a chain of command through our family. You know, he was in charge. So me and him, we, we would um, tussle sometimes and we would even fight sometimes. But the thing about it is, is that um, alhamdulillah, I knew he was supposed to be in charge, even though I would rebel from time to time. And uh, again, that sense of that male figure, my brother, if anybody would bother me, I'd bother me outside the house or if something would go wrong and my parents weren't there, I always had this sense of security that my brother was there and he was going to take the slack, you know. And I had a sister who was older than me and uh, she was a little more, as they say, the middle child. I think that's really real because uh, she was a middle child. So she was pulling from one side to the next side, you know, trying to figure out how she was going to do, deal with me. But I knew she was a big sister. And it was times where she had to step in and she stepped in real good. I'm not. Uh, so that was our little family. And um, my girlfriend told me that we were bougie. I said, bougie? I said, huh, how you can figure that? You know, how are we going to be bougie? She said, you had a television. I said, yeah, I used to watch Mickey Mouse, you know. And uh, she said, <laughs> something else I used to do. And she would say, oh, you were bougie. I didn't realize that... Um, we did have a lot of things that other people didn't have, but the way we were raised, we didn't. We, we thought everybody had whatever we had, you know? And my mother scraped her little pennies together and she worked as a domestic and she bought encyclopedias for us as we were children. Uh, she tried to maintain, um, uh, she wanted us to be educated. She wanted us to know what life was. She wanted us, and she said one time, she said, mm -hmm. I was raised children ought to be seen and, and not heard. She said, but I told, I said, no, if I have children or when I have children, inshallah, uh, my children aren't gonna be like that. They're gonna have, they, they say they're gonna be able to think, they're gonna be able to uh, express themselves and be whoever they want to be. And she was, she was freelance, you know, she was like that. In fact, sometimes I was just over the top with that. And I had to, after I became Muslim, apologize to my mother. I apologize. I said, oh, mom, I'm so sorry. I was just, she said, no, you were just you. You were always different. That's what she would always say. So, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. you, learned, you learned humility. Huh? Humility. Yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, sometimes, you know, mashallah. But <laughs> that was my, um, my nuclear family. Alhamdulillah. And, alhamdulillah. So, Tell us a little bit about going from Raleigh to Philadelphia. Oh my goodness, that was, um, those were the early days. You don't want me to get into uh, Philadelphia first before I came to Raleigh? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Huh? I'm sorry, you, you said you wanted to get into Philadelphia? 
yeah, you don't oh. want to get into Philadelphia first. That's where I took my Shahada in Philadelphia. Yes. So okay. Yes. Okay. How old were you then when you when you first uh, took your Shahada? I think we were in our twenties. We were a young group in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, yeah, we were all kind of young yeah. in our twenties, uh, early twenties. I was in my early twenties, and so many other people were there. Might have been in their like late twenties. I don't think. We saw old people at El, El Mujahideen. Most of us were youngsters uh, coming straight out of uh, the Black Panther Party or some cultural nationalist uh, kind of involvement. And we were ready to change the world. So by the time we you know, uh, went through what we went through before becoming Muslim, you know, we came in and Allah did it. It was just a shocking experience because I didn't read any books about Islam. Uh, I knew people, I was uh, a community worker with the Black Panther Party at the time, and um, people were just dropping out. They said, oh, so-and-so is Muslim now. We would go, oh, wow. Then, oh, so-and-so and so they Muslim now. We go, oh, wow. <laughs> we did that too. Almost all the people were gone. And then when my turn came, it was just a shocking experience because it wasn't like I had some uh, preconceived notion that I was going to read and I was, you know, Allah was working inside. And this is what I want to let you all know that Allah is always working on us. If we have sincerity in our heart and a sincerity of who am I? Who am I? What is my purpose? Why am I here? Say, you say, okay, okay, why am I here? You know, all those kind of things. And you're saying that within yourself, then Allah will guide you, you know, and uh, that's what he did uh, for me. You know, it was stepping stones. I would get to one level and I get as much good as I could get out of that. Then he would show me something else. So even the way I dress changed, you know, I started wearing my dresses longer because, you know, that was one of the points that people, you know, uh, the guys like the legs, you know, and then I would make sure that my, my chest and my breast was pretty much so covered as much as I could understand. But I made sure there was something about my hair uh, I tied my hair up in a gala, you know. So my as I moved from one level of consciousness to another, then my clothes changed. And believe it or not, by the time I took my shahada, I had uh, just before I took I had taken my shahada, I had a friend of mine, her sister, she made a garment for me. So we got the material, and I had this long piece, of course, for my gala. And then I had the beautiful dress with the long sleeves and down African print. And uh, it was sitting in there. I had not worn it yet. Believe it or not, when I took my Shahada, the first thing I said is, I don't have anything to wear. And I, that outfit was sitting there by the mercy of Allah. You know, so Allah takes us, you know, if we are sincere and we are talking to him, and not being impressed by anybody around us and anything that's going on around us, and we focus on Allah, Allah will focus on us. And that carries on to today because we got so much going on. But anyway, Philadelphia was a wonderful place for me because it helped me grow up. It, uh, it led me to Islam by the permission of Allah. You know, I had that freedom that my mother always wanted me to have. We had libraries, we went to the theater. We had opportunities that a lot of people don't have, especially in the South. We had it there. You know, I had places that I could go after school that I learned pottery. I learned uh, um, um, theater. Uh, we had uh, all kind of activities that was called the Friends Neighborhood Guild in uh, Philadelphia. And that's where I went after school each day. And uh, that was really something to have and for us again we have to have places, after school programs for our children, where they learn crafts, where they learn um, uh, theater, where they learn um, how to sing, you know, all these kind of things. We, this is who we are. We are full with all kind of talents. And we have to have a place and a platform where we can be, get, be, be or experience all these wonderful things Allah has put in us. You know, we can't just. Um, so, so, so here, I had went offline a little bit, so I kind of missed certain things that you were saying. But I wanted to touch on life before you converted in terms of social movements. We talked oh, a little bit about you being a part of the Panthers. The who? The Panthers. 
<clears throat> oh, okay. Oh, yes. but, okay. Well, before the pants, well, <laughs> before the plans is, I wanted you all to know in case nobody told you that we had a um, cultural revolution uh, that started before our spiritual revolution. And I'm and may, maybe we're still touched on both. We had a cultural revolution with music. You know, we had lyrics in our music and our music back then, um, I'm going to start with the blues. The blues was there because that man didn't know how to treat that woman. So he was crying, oh, baby, baby, please, please, you know. So we, those of us who didn't see that in our life, you know, where this man is pleading and he's done all this bad stuff to this woman, we got it in the music. So those were our textbooks in the beginning. Our textbooks was the music that Allah blessed us to learn life through. You know, and we learned that uh, through people like, um, uh, uh, I had written down some, uh, like, um, what's my girl's name? Gladys Knight. People like Gladys Knight, who she's fed up with her mistreatment and she's going. I'm on this midnight train to Georgia. So we're learning all these different things through the music although we're not actually going through it ourselves. So we have a perspective of life and what goes on in that life and the emotional things that go on in life without having to have to experience it ourselves. So a lot of us, we listen to the music, we listen to the lyrics and the lyrics was always taken to places. We had um, Aretha Franklin who was saying, respect, I want respect. I'm a woman and I want respect. She even taught us how to spell it, you know. To you all, it sounds like it's just music and you pat your foot and you dance. But for us, that was our textbooks. Listening to the lyrics that Allah blessed us with back there because that's the way we got it. Everybody get it differently. And that's what you all have to understand. If I lived in another place, I would have get it the way they get it wherever they are. And wherever they are, you're going to get it the way they are. We are African-American people. And it wasn't no accident that we were that we are African American people. So the way we learn, the way we interpret things, but touch our spirit is different from everybody else. Because Allah guides us through whatever we are. Allah meets us where we are. Again, Allah meets us where we are. Three times, Allah meets us where we are. So wherever we are in our consciousness, Allah comes there and he gives us gradual steps. He shows us gradual steps until he brings us to his fold, which is the religion of Islam. So don't get hung up on what you think you see and what you think, you know. Get hung up on, oh Allah, keep me Muslim. Make me your servant. And whatever somebody else is doing, is doing then you say, oh Allah, bring them in. Oh, Lord, make them Muslims. That's what the Sahabas did. When they saw their enemies acting up and when they saw these, this opposition, you know, yeah, they fought and they stood their ground. But at the same time, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, always invited them in. Always. So don't be so religiously arrogant that you can't invite people in and treat them right. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, Go over and when you get a chance in, in your um, Google or whatever and okay. look up some of the music in the 1960s, African-American music in the 1960s. And you're going to get some lyrics and some lessons from those songs mm -hmm. that, like I said, you couldn't live that. You know, you, could, you can hear it and experience it through the music, but most people would not have uh, had that experience in life. So. Like I said, the music was fantastic for us. It was a way to learn about things that we could not learn on our own. And it prepared us for the life we had to live here. Um, when I was in college, I, I took a course called Social Movements and Music. And so I had did like a presentation on Nina Simone and um, the uh, what's the name of her song? Fruits. The, um, the something fruit what's the name of the song but basically you know about the lynching in the south so yeah the, the lyrics back then had a lot of a lot of depth and meaning for sure 
And you know what the strange fruit, that's the name, strange, strange fruit. fruit. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you know what the strange fruit was, don't you? Yes. What was it? Oh, we in class. <laughs> Y'all didn't talk about it? You, See, you can talk about strange. it. <laughs> Y'all look that up too. Go ahead on this. To the song, strange fruit. These were, everybody mm -hmm. always know fruit hang from trees. Trees. But this was strange fruit because these were our ancestors who were lynched and hung on trees. Mm -hmm. So she called it strange fruit. That's right. That's right. So alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ooh, heavy. It's a heavy song. <laughs> it's a heavy song. Because it was a heavy life. And like I said, we didn't all have to experience that, but we experienced it through song. So for those people who don't understand us, it's okay. Mm -hmm. We don't understand them either. And it's still okay. Everybody has to grow and be whoever they are. And when Allah comes and gives us things for us, it's for us. And anybody else who want a piece of it can have it. But we have to accept what belongs to us. Absolutely. So let's get into the Black Panther. Um, let's get into the movement. <laughs> of course, everybody. Let's loves get Black into Panther. it. Power to the people, liberate. Let's yeah, let's get into yeah, it. Yeah. Power to the people. <laughs> Young people again, educated, because Huey Newton he surrounded himself from people that were college graduates and and, and students. So um, he took his. Um, um, I call it revolution in the streets and the cities of the poor people across the nation because we were just sitting there and just becoming dope addicts and whatever, you know, in the streets. So alhamdulillah, he came up with a program of change. And it was supposed to be a political change, hoping that through politics, people would be respected and we would have a better life in America for everybody, not just for Black people, but for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, she's frozen. Yeah, it froze for me too. Yeah, it froze. Maybe it'll come back up soon. Technical difficulties. Mashallah. She was she was preaching and teaching, mashallah. <laughs> yeah. So I let's get to the let's... Black Panther Party. Yes, yes. Let's get into it. Inshallah, let's see if she can um, come back. Maybe she has to go out and come back in. Let's mm -hmm. see. I wonder if she can still hear us. Right. I guess not. Let's Mr. Maybe. Tahira? Uh -oh. she might, yeah, she might come back in. She might have to come back in and come back out. So for those who are just tuning in, alhamdulillah, we are interviewing Sister Tahira, um, Abdullah, um, she is our first guest for a BAM Pioneers series, and um, she's having a little te technical difficulty, but inshallah, I guess she will come back when she can. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Alhamdulillah. And let's see, let's see, let me see what's going on. Hold on. Let me see. I really enjoyed our, well, in the meantime. I yes. <laughs> a little reflection. Um, I really I enjoyed it. how she mentioned how important the music was, you know, the fact that this is as a way to express a lives, lives that are being lived. Lived, right. Even though you I haven't guess. experienced it yourself. And we've all been through that, right? Like, even with our generation, there were songs that I was listening to that I didn't live through it. <laughs> but you felt it. It's like, I felt right. it. I feel, I feel the emotion. I feel the passion that the singer has. And yes. they kind of take you on this journey. Of, mm -hmm. almost, almost like storytelling where they right. take you on this exp this journey that they experience and they give you a little glimpse of you know what they what they went through exactly and like a big beautiful. brother or sister right yeah <laughs> it was beautiful <laughs> to see how that you. transition for her started with the music absolutely you know? I, I love the fact that she brought up the music because the music was very you know, it's very influential mashallah and um exactly. I love to listen to that type of music too. Cause like I'm stuck in my parents' era and then my era that I went to high school with. <laughs> Same. Our parents' music is just maybe my mama, she'd be like, What you know about that song? I said, Mama. 
<laughs> she, yes, 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 yes. My parents I learned it from you. you. They were like, where did you get that from? Wow. Mm-hmm. See, growing no. up listening to you feel it, so you'd be seeing your parents in the moment. You'd be like, oh, I feel it. I feel right. it too. <laughs> right, right, right. Yep, I get it from them. Going to see my grandparents, mm-hmm. you know. So it's, it's like she said, stuff. those lyrics, those lyrics will be hitting. Absolutely. Versus Absolutely. the mumble rap that's going on today. Yikes. I'm over it, girl. You okay? can I'm over it. <laughs> they can have it. <laughs> Man, I can't I even try it. to enjoy it. <laughs> I am over it. I need her to come back because I need to hear about the Panthers. <laughs> oh, wow. Let me see if I can call her and see what's happening. Maybe. Let me see. Let me see. Let's see. Oh, she's coming back. Okay. Okay. There she goes. Okay. Grand Umi is back. She's connecting. Let's see. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. What was the last thing I said? You're back in business. <laughs> the last thing was us getting, so we were talking, you were talking about cultural influence and the music, and then um, I wanted to know more about the Black Party movement. Black, okay. Party, Black Panther uh, Party movement. Yeah, Sorry. Really <laughs> yeah, I was talking about um, Huey Newton, uh, how he is surrounded himself with uh, students, you know, so he had a uh, a lot of um, educated students around him. Uh, he surrounded himself with um, people who had a sense of system. So he was go- trying to change a system. He was trying to make a system better than uh, than the one he he was under. <laughs> and, Is that uh, what attracted you to the movement? Well, no. What really what attracted me to the movement was the the way I came in, which was as a community worker. I was a community worker, which meant when you came to the office, you know, um, then you had chores, you had things to do. Because people came in with their problems to the Panther's office. We didn't have uh, social services to go to and all that other kind of stuff. In fact, we were the first one that started the free breakfast program for our children. Our children were going to school, half dressed and hungry. And as a community worker, what we did was to make sure that they had food every morning. So they came to the Panther office and uh, we fed them, then sent them to school. And of course, those people had those other kind of little gifts that like to put them little plaits in or something. They would kind of dress them a little. Everybody kind of put their touch in that um, uh, in that movement, you know, because we were we were an extended family to the people in the community. Right. Um, people so what who was the with, main difference between a Black Panther and a community worker? Because I didn't well, know that until you explained yeah, it. Yeah, it was the timing. The timing. Okay. Um, okay. Huey Newton was uh, sent to prison. Uh, well, he was sent to jail. You know, So when he went to jail, um, he told the Panthers, no more Panther, no Panther memberships at because he was in jail. So if people want to come and help, they can come as a community worker. And that's what we did. We came. That's when I came in. I came in as a community worker, okay. and those were some of the things we did. We people who um, like we would get parents that would come in and they wouldn't have enough food to last. Then we would go to the stores in the neighborhood, introduce the people to the store owner. This is Miss So and So. She's been shopping at your store for so many years. Uh, she's mm-hmm. in a situation where she doesn't have food, and she might be this way for the next week or two. And uh, uh, the grocer would put something in the bag and whenever mm-hmm. the lady would come back, you know, because people weren't taking advantage of people back then. People were pretty mm-hmm. good people, you know. And uh, so they would do that. So people would have food to eat. Even the people that didn't have, uh, like the brothers or the sisters who were going to work and stuff, they didn't always have uh, enough clothes. So what we would do is go back, go to the people, with the cleaners, the cleaners always had a section in there where the people wouldn't come back and get their clothes. So we ended up, they ended up, we came so much until they said, okay, the clothes are over there. And we would pick the clothes up. And when the people uh, would come into the office, I have a, uh, I have an interview. Do you have something that I can wear? 
and they would go out and pick whatever it is they, they could use and uh hum they lost. So it was it was good. It was um we didn't have so much in society in the society to to depend on. We depended on ourselves, which made us rich people. We were rich because we were uh, depending on ourselves and we were helping each other, which is something that's almost gone out the window. But mashallah, we have to get that back again. It's not hard to see who needs to help. Go down any major street and you'll see people there that's hungry, people who don't have shoes on in the winter time and winter coats. And we can carry those things in our cars and, and go ahead on feed some people from your cars and drop off some love, you know. But um, it takes heart. You have to have a heart. And we have to beg a lot for a heart again because something happened between the 60s and now, which um, lead me to say that uh, it might be the heart is not being used. And our society tells us our heart's not being used. So we got to go and uh, use our hearts again. Yeah. Mashallah. I agree. So, um, okay, so did you talk about how you became Muslim? What, how did you find out about Islam? I missed well, I, I was lost a little bit. My uh, computer got disconnected, but did she? Well, did she every time it? you talk to me, I got another story. But anyway, it's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, she's Muslim. <laughs> And I remember when she got her name, I wasn't yet, you know, because my little, uh, uh, I just said, I just love Muslims. They're wonderful, you know, but I don't really need to do all that. I was one of those kind of Muslims. You know? Who know. were the different type of communities that were around in Philadelphia at that time? Oh, it wasn't that many during that time. We had the Doris Line movement, which is, which was um, uh, the people who came from, usually they came from some kind of movement or some, some awareness. And now okay. they have Islam, so now we're going to do Islam. We're going to change the world. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so they had the Dark Islam movement. What other move, what other communities did they have? Uh, we had uh, Brother Nafi and his community in uh, West Philadelphia, across from Clara Muhammad School. Uh, they were they were our rocks because uh, they had an established masjid for years. Um, uh, Cuba. Cuba, yeah, they had an established okay. mindset. The mother and father and the children were invested in Islam. That was their life. That was their life. So when you went there, you got something very special, you know. Sure. So they were there. Okay. And, uh, the Moorish Temple, you said. That was uh, the Moors were always here because this uh, Philadelphia is a cultural mecca, a cultural mecca. I mean, every group you think exists uh, with African American people. They were in Philadelphia. Some fraction of those people were in Philadelphia. So you got a chance to bounce off of one group to the other. And because we still kept our love for each other, it wasn't no thing if you were sitting next to uh, a Moorish or you you talking about a fifth, a five percent or something or somebody who came from something else. We, you know, we loved each other and we and we loved our differences. And it was like living that live. So nobody was like. Yeah, uh, pouncing on you. Oh, why don't you do this? And ah, mm -hmm. come on, you know, no. Mm -hmm. Even with the um, uh, the black Muslims at that time, because their um their persona changed from time to time. So in the early years, it was that strictness. No, I, you know, it's like I can't get involved with you all. But mm -hmm. when when the, when we get around them corners and down them streets. We had a good relationship, you know, with black mm -hmm. Muslims, with no problem, you know. Right. And we survived for the corners because they had their paper and mm -hmm. the black people had, had their paper as well. So mm -hmm. we had to come to a, a, an agreement about the corners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Sister Tahira, how did your family react when you when you became Muslim? How did how, well? I know my mother was frightened. Uh, okay. my brother, he was always a, a conservative, so he kind of like laid in the hood. He, you know, like, we know she's deep anyway, so let's okay. like, wait and see what's going to happen with her. And then my sister, of course, she had just gone into her own life by then. Okay. But uh, I know my uh, mother was concerned uh, because okay. I did get picked up, you know. Um, right. Uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did any of your friends convert to Islam at the time? Um, no, because it was such a personal thing. Islam was so personal to 
Okay. You know, uh, it was hard to even detect what people were feeling, you know, the people yeah. that I was around because everybody was being themselves. I have never seen an era like that in my life. Everybody was busy trying to know themselves and how they fit in with this whole scheme of things mm. in this universe and in this these communities and all this stuff. So we mm. loved each other because we know, knew we were all uh, trying to grow. Mm-hmm. But we were trying to pull people into our personal thing. And I think that's personal. And I think that's something y'all can deal with too. Everybody's in their own personal role at a loss deal with them. So mm-hmm. don't think that your thing is going to fit theirs. You know, the only thing that's going to fit is a law. But all that other stuff, leave people alone. The law is making us who we are. He makes the Muslim. That's right. So let's get a little bit into your early days, right? You started off in the Dar al Islam movement. For those who don't know uh, about about the Dar, can you tell them a little bit about about who the Dar al Islam movement was? Yeah, alhamdulillah, these were some very conscientious um, young men and women. And uh, again, they came from movement as well. They came out of the um, cultural revolution of music. we had the last poets, the brother who was that, you know, he, they gave messages, messages. Um, Gil Scott Heron, all these kind of people gave messages, messages. And um, Darla's line kind of came out of that kind of, that, um, that whatever, you know. <laughs> and, right. uh, if you look at YouTube and you see the video on Brother Saeed, Ah, uh, that will blow your mind because a I lot of that history, <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of that history I didn't know. I didn't know all that pre the Al Islam movement, you know. So Alhamdulillah, if you get a chance, look at that. Um, so um, the Al Islam movement, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> the, the Al Islam movement. movement. Who was the imam oh, okay. of of the movement? And um, it became yeah. it it became very popular, especially on the East Coast. A lot mm-hmm. of the brothers join in, and that's where I got my first glimpse of uh, unified brotherhoods. Uh, we have organized groups living in different places under the same banner. Mm-hmm. Because you had um, uh, Jamil Alamin, who came in later. Uh, you had uh, some really um, people who, you know, Jamil Alamin, you know, he came from right out of the uh, civil rights movement, and he was um, mm-hmm. you know, instrumental in trying to fix things in America, justice and equal, uh, um, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. <laughs> right. Equality. Right. Equality so tell us a little America. bit about the community. Uh, like what, what was the name of the mission in Philadelphia? It was um, called El Mujahideen. El Mujahideen was the, um, for us okay. in Philadelphia, the Darl Islam movement. movement. You know, it was one of the chapters. You had some in New York and you had some mm-hmm. uh, in different other places, but our masjid was uh, deemed uh, part of the Dallas Islam movement. Mm-hmm. So we worked uh, that our community worked with different communities in other states. You know, mm-hmm. we've got something going called the Riata. I guess you've heard about the Riata that we've been doing mm-hmm. for many, many years. Yes. Um, yes, and um, worked in prisons. A lot of the brothers worked in the prison program for Dawa um, mm-hmm. and educational programs, of course, and uh, mm-hmm. in the streets. And mm-hmm. also uh, in the masjids, developing masjids, trying to build masjids, um, those kind of things. Yeah. Right. So how was is how was learning Islam in the Dar al Islam movement? It was interesting because um, it was new. So we were feeling our way. You know, we were we would do something one minute and see mm-hmm. if it worked, and if it didn't work, we do something else. But primarily, we had classes. And I'm telling you, I have been in a community that had classes like the Darl. Wow. You, you, could, you could go there any day of the week, have a good lesson, and do some good work. And when you go home, you don't go to sleep when you go home. You pass out because by the time that day was over, you were exhausted. And the masjid was a pulse. It stayed busy. People were coming in. People were going out. Lessons were going on. Things were happening. It was a pulse. Even at nighttime, that mosque gym was still open and they would have the desk. They call it the desk. So that means some brothers had to be there and be on the desk so that um, if anybody came in at night and wanted to know about Islam, they would teach them. Uh, you know, it was just never stopping day and night. 
day and night. Brothers who were traveling before they would go home, if it was late, 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 they would spend the night in the masjid. You know, it was just, um, it was just a wonderful, I can't hear you. I can't hear oh, I'm you. I'm sorry, I'm here. Did they have sisters classes? That was oh, goodness, yes, yes, that was, mm -hmm. oh, the class, when I say classes and learning situation, yes, we always had classes. Sister okay. Saida was my first Arabic teacher. Oh, and so uh, she <laughs> taught me the bad boos and the bad boos. She was <laughs> here for, for a lot of us. Um, and mm -hmm. of course, they, at one point, at another point, as we, uh, mm -hmm. as we, uh, uh, in in the movement, they would send mm -hmm. certain people to us. So we had brothers and scholars that from time to time that would come in and teach us the thick of wudu. Uh, mm -hmm. I learned that from, uh, and I can't even say who he was, but we know he was somebody <laughs> coming right. in and teaching us. Something. <laughs> and we have a fantastic man by the name of Dr. Faruqi. May Allah have blessed, uh, mm -hmm. blessed his heart and soul and everything else about him because he and his wife came in and he basically adopted us. You know, he saw something mm -hmm. in this and he wanted to give as much as he could. Right. And he mm -hmm. set something up for the brothers to go to um, uh, DC because we had a, a noted shake again in DC that I can't say his name. Uh, anyway, he taught them uh, the Tajweed of Quran. So when they came back to teach us, then uh, th those were, we, we learned how to, uh, pronounce the words properly and, and uh, uh, tab, tab, hmm, with the tajweed with it. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know anything about tajweed. We just thought we were learning mm -hmm. how to um, uh, read the Quran, you know, right. because we basically did whatever we heard them say, mm -hmm. that's how we would say it. They didn't get into this is the that, that's the this, and you hold it in good night. They didn't do that. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, we have to return to that because a lot of us, we're not mm -hmm. learning and we'll drop out of the classes because they are so technical. Just say, when you get to here and you see this, this is what you do, you know? So mm -hmm. that's how we did. We had recordings that we had that we listened to. And uh, that's how basically we got our, um, our, our Tajweed and our Quran. And I didn't realize it until I became older. And one of the sisters said, okay, uh, sister, you can lead the, the prayer. I said, well, okay. So I got up there and led the prayer. And uh, when I got finished, she was just amazed. She said, who taught you that? I said, one of my classes. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> so okay. I didn't know uh, until after I had, she had made me aware that um, we, we were taught good. We were taught good. And people that were sent to help us, they did good. They did good. My In friend. fact, Dr. Faruqi, um, he was um, uh, one of the professors at Temple University. He was trying to get uh, some volunteers so that he could uh, try to establish an Arabic class mm -hmm. because Arabic wasn't taught in the universities then. You know, no mm -hmm. university, there was no Arabic. So he mm -hmm. wanted to get a pilot group together so he can try to figure out how to teach this. And mm -hmm. he did his best. He did the best he could. And, but what, we realized later is that you cannot teach a non-Arabic speaking uh, person Arabic the way you would teach an Arabic speaking person. Mm -hmm. And that's where our dilemma comes in because a lot of times uh, the approach is not, or the technique is not one that is compatible for, our, for us because we've mm -hmm. never seen these characters before, mm -hmm. but they've seen these characters all their life. We mm -hmm. never heard these sounds before, but they've heard these sounds all their life. Here we come in with absolutely no uh, uh -huh. reference to this, but mm -hmm. uh, we we're expected at one class to write a word on the board and be able to say it, which is some people did it, a lot less those people who did it, they mm -hmm. did it, but it's very difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. So, so, so here, I wanted to ask you, when you uh, first became Muslim, right? Um, what were some things that you had a challenge with in terms of implementing in the religion? Were there, did you have any challenges? Oh, were there goodness. some things that you were strong at that, you know, such as maybe not eating pork or abstaining from, you know, mm -hmm. certain things? <laughs> yeah. 
that wasn't too much of a thing because of, again, okay. because how a law was bringing me. Now, it might be a problem for some other people okay. because I was consciously asking God, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'm seeing this now, but, and I, what, I, what I would always relate to it is, is that it was like a puzzle in my head. It was this puzzle that he would give me a piece to put in that place. Oh, I see where that's working. I'll do that now. And then mm -hmm. another piece of the puzzle would come and I would put it over there and then it would be a, this awakening again. So that's for me, that's how it worked. So by the time I got to Islam, I was ready for it. And I wanted it all. I didn't want a little bit. Before mm -hmm. I left the masjid, when I took my shahada, by Allah's mercy, 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 and his guidance, that guy had to write down the uh, uh, the whole um, prayer. How what a, what the Fati hours? He put it in transliteration, and what I say when I bow and when I stand, because we had these Friday nights that we would go to um, the masjid, and people who wanted to learn about Islam would come. And, be, and I took my child one night when I went there, and he had, he said, "Oh, you don't have to do that, sis." Just come on back and we have classes on. I said, no. I said, I, all the prayers, I, I understand those. But I said, I may have problems with that Fajr prayer, that morning prayer, because I'm not used to being up that, that late. I mean, that early in the morning. So I said, but uh, just write it down on a piece of paper. So I ended up writing. He was saying it and I was writing it. I had my little piece of paper. So when I went home, you know, I said, well, it's kind of late now. I probably, I might miss this prayer. I sat there in a corner with my towel on the floor. And uh, when the time for Faja came, took my little piece of paper out and I made my prayer the best way I could, you know, according to that. So I didn't want a little bit of Islam. I want both feet in. I want both feet in. And that's how Allah let me dive in. Sure. And I've been you, you fully, you fully embraced the deen. Yeah, I, I wanted it. I wanted it, you know, I really mm -hmm. wanted it. So uh, sincerity, going back to sincerity, sincerity mm -hmm. will take us a long way, mm -hmm. you know, um, if we're sincere to Allah, he'll take us and he'll, he'll take us where we need to be. That's right. Sister Tahira, I want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, your experience in the dark. Um, oh. Marriage. Let's talk about marriage. Uh, <laughs> marriage is such a, uh, they say it's oh. half of our dean, right? So yeah. Sure. When you yes. went to the Dara, you knew La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you knew it. You were tough on it. <laughs> you, yes. you knew that you had to be married. <laughs> that was in it. And because Dara believed, you know, not believed, they uh, understood polygyny the way they understood polygyny. You knew that that was part of, it, it may be a part of your lifestyle. You wasn't left to think that you know, it's just going to be you and and uh, and your husband. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you you knew that up from the beginning. The polygyny was part of this religion. So if you didn't know it before you walked in the door, you knew it by the time uh, uh, you got in there good. So wow. uh, how was the courting process like? How was it finding a husband mm -hmm. uh, during that time? Well, for me, it was a little different because. Okay. Uh, you know, um, you know, I saw somebody that I, I thought that I was compatible with. He was smart, he knew his religion, he knew the Arabic, good Muslim. And uh, I said, that's the kind of guy I think I wanna have. And uh, I went for it. So I said it to somebody, I think I said it to one of the sisters and, uh, and she was in polygyny. But anyway, that doesn't mean anything, but anyway. Uh, we had this squat. That's what they would call it. <laughs> when you sit down. The squat. This is my second time <laughs> hearing this. <laughs> you heard that? One. You ever heard that? One? Yeah. The people it's, from yeah, the Dara. Last year, yeah. Sister Jamila Gardner <laughs> said that you know she she comes from the Dara as well, and she said that they had a squat, and that was my first yeah. time hearing about the squat. <laughs> you sat on your side. He sat on his side, and you had this conversation. Right. I sit down. Right. So, okay. Um, that was basically how that was the procedure usually yeah. somebody would either the man would see somebody or the lady would see somebody and then you had this squat so in that spot you would decide whether or not you want to go forward or you know nice meeting okay. you alhamdulillah you know okay. so um 
Was the Wally yeah. present at these squats or was it in the public? I, I think I do remember somebody walking around in the room, but okay. what, as we understand uh, a Wally, I didn't see that. And I, I'm thinking maybe because I hadn't gotten to that point yet. Maybe the squat mm -hmm. came first and something else was supposed to come. <laughs> but we were trying to find our way. We didn't, we didn't know. We were trying to just find our way. I'm, I'm curious as to know what was being asked at these squats. Like, were these in like were these were these important questions being asked? Like, what kind well, of people? It's only two people. See, you okay, everybody comes with something. If you okay. come in there trying to um, figure out if this is uh, your guy, or this is the kind of person you want to marry, then you're going to ask certain questions, and he's going to ask certain questions too to see if. Uh, that person can fit into his lifestyle and if he would want that person to you know to uh, be the teacher of his children because that's mm -hmm. what a wife is she's the one who teaches the children and supports the man in, in whatever efforts that they uh, he's trying to do so right. and we have a, a, a helpmate you know so yeah. if you come with that kind of thinking then mm -hmm you'll get, I think, what you, you'll hear or get whatever you, you, you're looking for. But if you come in there with some other kind of whatever, then you mm -hmm. get that too. It depends right. on what you're coming in there for and what your thoughts are and what you, you know, what right. you're looking for. What were some things that women asked for as a, as a, as a maher back then? Like, um, Oh, oh, we were strewn, stone up Sufi back then because most of our books came from Pakistan <laughs> back in those days. That's another thing. Oh, well, you were talking about books. <laughs> uh, all our books about Islam primarily came from Pakistan. So we used to laugh about it later and I said, yeah, we were just Sufis, boy. We, we were never Sufis. <laughs> because Alhamdulillah, it is a good, it, we can laugh about it on one hand, but it was, mm -hmm. it was wonderful that you could mm -hmm. ask for teach me uh the Quran mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. okay so that was a maher back then was to ask like for the yeah, brother it was the act of maher. Yeah. <laughs> wow yes. what else were, was sisters although, asking for although at the same time those people who had a uh more of a knowledge of what that meant and what that entailed mm -hmm. uh they asked you know so uh but okay. for those of us who were just coming in and we hadn't got to that page on uh <laughs> your <laughs> <laughs> your wedding gift we right. were kind of stuck in the pakistani books where we were just just these people who just oh brother just teach me a, the quran teach me a sword from the quran you know right. if you didn't have a ring or anything oh it's okay it's okay you know so we were really you know caught up into something real deep it was sweet though <laughs> it, was, it was sweet <laughs> <laughs> oh wow subhanallah wow <laughs> such a huge difference from now subhanallah oh yeah in fact it's too extreme now i'm telling you which your generation i'm telling you y'all need to be spanked Ooh. because you can't go into a relationship based on money you know what when you go into a relationship based on money i'm not going to say the word what is it and that's it oh that's what it is. If you go on into a relationship based on money, it's what it that's what it is. We ain't gonna say it. You I know heard it. I heard it. It is. Read between the lines. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's what it is. So try to get into those um books on the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Get into your books about the um the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Khadijah and particularly her, because he had nothing. He, he, uh, the Prophet Muhammad was a merchant, but he wasn't wealthy like Khadijah Radi Allahu Anha. Mm -hmm. But she looked at that character. And when she saw that character, she was like, uh uh, mm -hmm. this is it right here. You know, so we have mm -hmm. to look at that too. Not how many uh, zeros is in a person's pocket, because mm -hmm. we know what that is. And you need to keep it in your head that that's what it is. If you're looking for the money, that's what it is. Look for the character. How God conscious is he? Is he praying? Is he is he is he is he truthful? Is he kind? Is he is he loving? You know, you have to look at those those things too. And then even if he doesn't have the buck, 
then at least you can work together because because the person has some integrity and has something good in them, you won't work that out. And people work that out every day because this system has been set up to destroy families. So they'll give the woman the job and won't give the man the job. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he doesn't want it. So if that woman realized what her role is and that man understand what his role is, then a respect has to flow between the two of them. And however they work their situation out, Mm -hmm. in an oppressive society that pulling us apart all the time, mm -hmm. then work the thing out. Keep your girlfriends out of your business. Stop talking so much because they're going to give you advice that they ain't going to follow themselves. Mm -hmm. Stop listening to them. It's you, your husband, and Allah and read the sunnah and then have a happy life because any other way, it's going to be fitna, fitna, fitna. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I hear you. What role did uh, the brothers and the uh, women play in the community at the Dar, in the Dar movement? Well, the women were, again, uh, they weren't as uh, outspoken as most because I think some of those women had not been a part of any organizations or had been in, in, in any movements before Islam. So they, do, they were nice, good wives. You know, they stayed home, took care of their babies you know, um, did all the good stuff. We used to take our babies everywhere we went. It wasn't a place we wouldn't go if we couldn't take our babies. That's how deep we were. Even in the classroom, we teaching a class and rocking a baby with our foot. You know, we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alhamdulillah, the women were people, you know, and the men, they, they were trying the best they can because of course the brothers, <sighs> the stuff that came on them wasn't like the women, you know, they mm -hmm. were, they were. They were trying, people were trying to assassinate our men, you know, wow. so, yeah, so women knew that they were uh, understanding, they were kind, and they, mm -hmm. uh, they loved the law enough to uh, keep things going mm -hmm. well, because right. you had to keep things going well, yeah. Can you, talk, can you talk a little bit about the support? You told me a little bit about how the women would support the men in their educational pursuit. Oh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Women, uh, for the most part, especially in Philadelphia, we always talk and we always try to come up with strategies uh, uh, to help in uh, our struggle and in keeping our families together. And one of the things that we came to uh, during that early 60s was they're not giving our men jobs. They're going to have to go back to school. Uh, so if they go back to school, then we're going to have to hold it down. So that was, for some women, that was uh, the choice that, that was made in order for our husbands or, our, you know, our husbands to, to get mm -hmm. into the system or get the kind of jobs that will provide homes and all the things that we wanted to make our lives better. So that's what the sisters did. Those brothers went back, they got their uh, master's degrees and uh, just for them to say, mm -hmm. uh, you overqualified. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see what devils, devils. At any rate, they said that now that they did that. So the brothers, I always respect uh, Elijah Muhammad uh, in that he told them, have your own business, get your own jobs, you know, be an entrepreneur, you know, because they ain't going to give you nothing. And then even if they give you something, it's going to come with a price. So mm -hmm. I appreciated him giving that to not just his community, but for every black man to, you know, they, you know, go ahead and, and be an entrepreneur, get your own um, businesses and stuff, because they are always going to come up with something else. So mm -hmm. but it was, it was a conscious effort to try to fix something in a system that uh, refused to be fixed. Can, you, can we talk a little bit about uh, the split that happened um, in the Darla Islam movement uh, yeah. when Sheikh Jelani had came? Um, yeah. How Jelani, was it? Yeah. Yeah. When Sheikh Jelani came, mm -hmm. it was um during the time I think I was in, I had come back to North Carolina then, but my son was still there. So um because he was always been a community member and uh, you know, part of the Jalala Scouts and all that stuff. They had <laughs> wonderful programs for the youth. So uh when he did come, I did notice something happening that um the community was being split. Some people were uh, you know, wanting to hear this message, and they had began to get a, um, uh, 
uh, uh, I want to be respect, uh, respectful. Uh, okay. uh, they liked his mes message. So what okay. they ended up doing was going with um, his teachings. And you know, his teachings go back. You know, his father was uh, part of uh, a Sufi group too. So when he came mm -hmm. here to America, he went to the Darl of all places. I was shocked by it, you know, because I, I've never seen anybody that was in our movement. And, and it was hard for me to believe that somebody outside of our group, I better just say race, could influence them like that. Because mm -hmm. we were black folks. We were black and our proud, fists up in the air. And then somebody mm -hmm. out in another group mm -hmm. came and influenced them that way. So that shocked me. I was really shocked by that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones who didn't, didn't think that that was the way that they wanted to go, mm -hmm. they, um, they had to go through a, a moment. They had to go through that uh, a thing of trying to figure it out. You know, where mm -hmm. are we now? What are we going to do? Are we going to go with our, you know, our buddies? Because these, these mm -hmm. people loved each other. They had, were into, I mean, they had children that was married to other people's uh, child. I mean, it was a close knit mm -hmm. community. So mm -hmm. that was major. So yes. by the permission of Allah, Allah told, told that group, no, go ahead and reestablish yourself in West Philadelphia. You are, you are El Mujahideen, Masjid. You were that before, you went through this, and now you are El Mujahideen. And get back to the agenda that you came in with. And they stayed. The wonderful mm -hmm. thing is that now, years later, I mean, in the beginning, it was just unheard of the people coming back together. But now mm -hmm. you see more people, you know, they're adults, they have grandchildren, great grandchildren now, and they are able to talk and they have a, a, mm -hmm. a pretty good relationship. So some things you just have to wait, you know, don't curse people and blame mm -hmm. people. I'm just be patient. A lot got that. Everybody got to go through whatever they got to go through. Everything mm -hmm. is the kata of Allah. Everything is the kata of Allah. Everything Absolutely. is the kata of Allah. It's how we deal with the kata of Allah. Are we going to be saying, thank you, Allah, for what you allowed to exist? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm going to praise you and keep doing whatever you've been doing. Or mm -hmm. are you going to scream and holler, blame everybody else and mm -hmm. put up petitions and do that? Mm -hmm. What you need to do is our behavior that's being tested. The kata is going to be there. But what is your behavior when a law manifests this thing to happen? We aren't mm -hmm. in control of nothing, not even ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the test. Whatever kata Allah gives us, mm -hmm. check your behavior. Turn Absolutely. your face to Allah. Say, La ilaha Allah, and mind your business, and you'll be safe. You know, but if you don't, <laughs> oh, the shaitan is gonna go in there and have a good time. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Oh, I, I wanted to ask you something about the dar before we move on to the next. How was the uh, Ramadans and Eid back oh, then? Wonderful. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had an Eid better than in, wow. Philadelphia, in Philadelphia. They, uh, all the communities would get together. They put in there, they would figure out what place they wanted to have the Eids and stuff. And mm -hmm. they put their monies together and they strategy. And we would have a wonderful time all day long. I remember my first one, we had it at Temple University. Mm -hmm. We had uh, children who did plays in the beginning and sang songs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then we had the big eat, you know, food. Mm -hmm. you know. And then it, it graduated to the stadium, uh, the stadium where you have mm -hmm. vendors all around. And then you have all these jumpy games and everything for the children to play on. You could just sit back there chat with the sisters all day while the children just had have a ball so that has been something that um has been outstanding about philadelphia and that is their mm -hmm. ease they have excellent ease alhamdulillah mashallah so i want to move on to saudi arabia right <laughs> <laughs> what made you want to go to saudi arabia how was that what, okay. what was the, well, yeah. i went there because uh, the husband uh, my husband um uh, he got a job there after me. Okay. Oh, these people don't want you. They're not giving you enough money. They don't, they're not appreciating you. Go on over there and get some of that Saudi money stuff. Yeah. But come on, let's go. And I said, and then I can go to school. <laughs> MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So, so, alhamdulillah. <laughs> he went over there and he got a job. 
making good money. And uh, I went to school. They had these schools that were called, uh, it was like a GED program. So when you went into them, these were the women who didn't finish high school. Uh, so, and that was one of the skeletons in the closet because they would pull those girls out of school at a certain age and get them ready for the house and a husband. And a lot of these girls didn't get their education. So, uh, so a lot of the uh, women, they mm -hmm. couldn't read, they could not write. Although they came from a scholarly family, mm -hmm. the man did and the boys did, they could, you know, mm -hmm. but and some of them couldn't even read uh, anything of the Quran. Okay. But anyway, so, I would, yeah. I would so you said them. it was a GD program, but was this, um, what does that look like in Saudi Arabia? Is it, does it look like the GD program here or? Was it so they would use the same school that they had the children go to in the daytime and then the women who wanted to be educated they would come in the evening yeah okay. so it was good and they had everything they had math science uh, history arabic islamic studies mm -hmm. they had all the subjects there okay wow how was life as an american woman a black american woman in saudi oh girl <laughs> at that time honey anything that came out of america they were smiling wow. and they anything that came out of america now what them. what gear was this what what decade was this this was um layla was in the first grade <laughs> okay <laughs> I don't know what kids have to tell me things. Okay. <laughs> Taylor was in the first grade. She went through the first grade there. And uh, we had okay. some cultural differences, even in the school, uh, because they, they didn't mind smacking a child in the face. They didn't oh, see really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. You would think that, see, and that's our thinking. They had here in Saudi Arabia, they have the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but people aren't reading. And that's the problem. When you don't read, you don't know. You know, and then your culture will tell you it's okay because you don't have nothing to come in between your culture and, and, and whatever else that you're doing. So when that happened, you know, mm -hmm. North Philly start, you know, coming up and I said, I can't be North Philly in no, in no Saudi Arabia. You got to know what North Philly is, you know. <laughs> so I said, I can't be uh -huh. that here, you know, so I said, oh, okay. So I got a friend of mine who knew who was studying Arabic. I say, write this letter and write it exactly the way I'm saying it. <laughs> and he wrote the letter. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I'm in there with the administration, right? So, you know, a couple of times the finger had to go up and it did not happen again. You know, so that was done and we didn't have any more problems with that hand. You don't spat people. You know, you just don't mm -hmm. do. That. That's a no-no. No, that's Especially a no. in the face, right? Like yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was like no big thing because they were used to doing that. Mm -hmm. The children, so subhanallah. So, but anyway, I loved it because I could walk down the streets where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked down. I could go to the Prophet's mosque and sit any place I wanted to in there and read and study and just try to feel the, the <laughs> what was going mm -hmm. on. I got a chance to see people who were coming in for the same reason I was and meeting so wonderful people. That's just from, um, South Africa, you know, you name it, they were in there. And uh, one sister, as, as I was coming in, she said, I'm running behind you. I said, I look back and say, what is it? She said, I could tell the way you walked that you weren't from here. I'm from South Africa. I said, oh, great. Okay, okay. And we had a good time after that because of, <laughs> You know, uh, then she was talk, telling me how they were uh, expecting her to change her passport and put white on it because her skin was white. South Africans could get real light. They didn't like being white. She, told, she said, no, I'm black. I'm black. And, you know, <laughs> she would change it. And mm -hmm. they were getting kind of upset with her. I said, mashallah. I said, but we have to deal with this racism thing wherever we go. So mashallah, at least mashallah. she was bad. You know, it could have been something else. Yeah, were you so, able to make Hajj when you were there? 
I mean, Uma twice while I was there. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we took the children, so we all got a chance to kiss the black stone. <laughs> nice. And the kids go it to hundred. Don't try to go in there and get killed by those people. And with the, oh, back wow. then, the, the people were knocking the people with sticks and stuff, so they get off the uh, black stone. And <laughs> when I saw that in the daytime, I said, "Oh no, this is not safe." But uh, be a to hundred mm-hmm. person. Go to that mosque here to hundred. And uh, inshallah, and then you'll see different kind of people. Cause uh, I stood, uh, one man, I was standing in the line around the car mm-hmm. and one man kept motioning me to go up, come up, come up. So I went up with the children and I stood on an angle. So when one man kissed the black stone, then I would put one of my kids through, they would kiss the black stone. And the next man would kiss the black stone, and I would put the next child up there and kiss them all up, kiss the black stone. No and uh, oh, that, that was nice. It's just a different people, it's 100 people, just different. Yeah. No Sounds like a really nice experience. So you stayed for one year in Saudi? Academic, yeah, we went in when school started, and I left out of there. Uh, by the time they were going to be let out for, for the school term. But that mm-hmm. one year felt like five, you know, because it was mm-hmm. so rich. I learned mm-hmm. a lot of the culture, my neighbors, um, and they were learning a lot of stuff too, because I know one neighbor, uh, she had me up. She said, oh, please come, come. I said, okay. Went to the thing. Mm-hmm. And she had a sister in there that was um, uh, the housekeeper or something, and she was from mm-hmm. some African country. And we just locked eyes and she could and she could speak English. So <laughs> I started asking the question. We was going back and forth. So the host was like, oh, she likes her. And she she had her to sit. Come, come sit with us. You know. So <laughs> she sat down and uh with us uh and we all discussed things, you know, what was going on, mm-hmm. you know, how was she really being treated and all that kind of stuff, you know. So <laughs> it was I mean, a, and it helped them, I think her, the lady who invited me, mm-hmm. to get more of some of that prejudice, you know, because mm-hmm. it was like that. Although we know slavery was supposed to have been long gone in that area, mm-hmm. slavery still, in terms of practice and how people were treated, was a lot the same. A Absolutely. Lot the same, you know, there was no appreciation of personal, of people and their rights and their dignity and their honor. You know, you here to work for me, you know, do as you, you know. Yes. But, and I'm sure you found some other people that were nicer and probably, you know, would be mm-hmm. better people, but you still have to know that racism is straight there. It's live. It's live. One of the things I did get when I was there as a, a some kind of feeling for us from them is that one mm-hmm. of the people told me, she said, you are Americans. You, are, you your sister. She said, you rocked the world. You shook the world up. Everybody woke up and said, my rights, my rights. I said, oh, yeah, nah. sure and um, we need to know that. We, ha- mm-hmm. we need to know what, how we have influenced the whole world. Nobody's mm-hmm. going to give that to us in a textbook. We have to tell each other and let us know that we are respected all over the world, you know, and everybody has gained something from us, you know. Even down to and even down to Michael Jackson. Can you imagine going down the streets of Medina in your car and somebody blasting Michael Jackson music? (laughs) 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 But uh, our culture again, that people love it, you know. So, mashallah. Mm -hmm. So let's get back into. So you come back to the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Was that when you became a part of the Islamic Party uh, of North America? Well, I had already been a part of them in the early days, but this was my okay. second encounter with the uh, Islamic Party because when I set foot back in the States after Saudi, that's where I went. You know, okay. Imam Khalid, yeah, his community. Let's talk a little bit about that. So some people who don't know who that party is, is it a lot of people that they heard of it, but they don't really know about it. So oh, the Islamic Party? Well, the yeah. DC part of the Islamic Party was fantastic. I mean, I didn't have to go outside of that community for anything. We had a, a store called the Hunger Stopper. Yeah. Um, okay. We had a um, down the street. We had a like a tea or a little soft jazz and um, poetry spot. Mm-hmm. You know, 
you can have that little time with your wife or your husband or whatever, and you know, alhamdulillah, and chill. And then we had um, uh, the brothers primarily had a business of cabs. That's how they kept their finances going. So if they were in between jobs or they needed a job, you can always you know, do the cab thing. And during that time, cabs were doing very well. People were doing it and tipping and all, having all that kind of stuff. So money, it, it was a money flow. Mm -hmm. So um, so that was pretty much intact. Um, mm -hmm. I worked with uh, Brother Collett. You know, Collett when, when Collett, I was- You mean Collett Griggs? Yeah, I'm the, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he- when I, he, uh, it was some kind of program going on and uh, he said, you need to come, come to the program, so-and-so. So I went to the section uh, in the in my street where they were having the, pro the, the program and they showed a picture of apart apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching this. It's just going through the reels, what was going on. People being snatched and thrown all over the place because they don't have uh, uh, ID you know, people living in places look like cardboard, you know, um, women uh, working multiple jobs for a little bit of pay so that they can keep their kids with some food, you know, it was just horrible, that that whole, and then you get the contrast where the people are jumping in the swimming pools, and they're mm -hmm. eating, uh, they're on the yachts, and eating martinis, and all that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, so mm -hmm. it was just, just this, it was horrible, so I'm watching this, so I get up, because by now I'm, I'm hot, I'm hot, I'm hot, and not in heat. And I went back to his little office in the back, and he was smiling like, yeah, this is what we're doing, you know. I hit the desk. I said, what are we doing about this? And then his boy, you know, because you always got, all of them always got the boy. He getting ready to leave. He pushing him back, leave him alone, leave him alone, let him talk. I'm bad. I probably could have beat him too. <laughs> I'm not one of those best. So he said, that's why we need you on our team, sister. <laughs> he said, we're trying to get, because he came from the Panthers. Oh, well, he, I don't know if he was a community worker or, or, or what, but he was came through that influence. And um, so he knew. He knew what the deal is. You know, we can't become Muslim and all of a sudden we didn't forget. And that was one of the things that um uh I knew, uh, I thank Allah allowing me to return to that because the first parts in the dar was more getting myself together, getting mm -hmm. my spirit together, trying to know about my religion, know my communities, knowing that all the Muslims are my sisters and brothers, you know, all that foundation. And then mm -hmm. when I went with them, it was like, oh, Allah, free at last. I'm back where I like to be. And that's wow. what the people you know, so that's how you felt and, at the at, in the party in the Islamic party. Uh, yes, and um, unfortunately, or I'll put it, I'll say unfortunately. Okay, I'm saying unfortunately, a lot of the sisters did experience did not experience what I experienced because I got with the organization that um, uh, Imam Khalid was with, and in that organization, I was able to uh, be a part of. Uh, other organiz uh, national organizations, international organizations, uh, people who were doing stuff in the city, black men against rape, because at that time, a lot of women were being raped and coming up with solutions, hanging out with the Indians, you know, uh, who became mm -hmm. Muslims and some not, but just giving them down to let them know that, mm -hmm. you know, this is an alternative to you. It was just exciting. It was just exciting. So I was so glad to be in an environment that I love being in again. You know, okay. So, so you felt free. <laughs> yeah, I felt my old spirit again. That spirit mm. of, you know, yeah, we're going, you know, humbly like, you know, something got to change. The system just has to get better. Mm. And we have to put something good in the system with mm. the hope that this good would just flourish. And then it will become a whole system of goodness. And because now we have the, the method, this is Islam. Islam is the way to bring about that peace. Islam is the way to make, it, it gives us all the solutions to all the problems that everybody has. So before uh, it was like um, a, a philosophy uh, with the Black uh, Panther Party, more of a philosophy, but with Islam, it became a system. And I had never, Mm -hmm. known Islam to be a system. 
I always saw it as a religion. That's why a lot of times I don't like to say religion. As, mm. But it's a system. And mm. if that, when that system is established, it grows and develops. And we have proof of that when you look at Muslim Spain, mm -hmm. you know, how that system, you know, came. And we were called, the Muslims were called then because the um, Europeans were so mean and hateful. They called mm -hmm. us. Uh, and mm -hmm. Tariq and his people, they came in and uh, helped get that situation straightened out. And that was the longest, I think, lasting, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to say, empire but, uh, was with the Muslims. And they incorporated all the rules of Islam. So when you came to that system, mm -hmm. you came with whatever you had that was good. If it fit within the Islamic uh, um, uh, law, uh, not being too much of one thing and not too less of another, then it was welcome. So if you were, um, you know, whoever you are, you could keep your church as long as you don't go out there and propagate and try to pull other people uh, to come to your church. But if you wanted your services, you had to. If you had your synagogues, you could still have your synagogue and you paid the jizra, you paid the tax. And that tax allowed you to have uh, safety, security uh, in that Muslim um, uh, government. So let me ask worked. you about the uh, learning Islam and the Islamic Party movement. How was was it similar to the Darl, or was it different? It was a little different. Yeah, I noticed okay. uh, from them. Darl was straight up books. They had uh, some of the brothers were trying to get us to memorize the books in English. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, they were definitely book uh, mm -hmm. people. Uh, where in the Islamic party, I think most of the emphasis was on uh, developing uh, community. In that community, you had sisters who had gone back to school, they became nurses. You had brothers who went back to school that became uh, doctors. Mm -hmm. that, that community uh, produced some very, very uh, uh, outstanding people. Um, right, you were telling me that there were a lot of talented. It was a lot of talented and professional yeah. people. Um, yes. They came the, through the party. There's a lot of people that came through it because at that time that was the most progressive that I could see uh, organization that was going on. Some people stayed that like that kind of, um, I'll say, regiment because uh, the leadership there they didn't play. You know, they had guidelines and you followed those guidelines. You know, and some people need that, and some people like that kind of organization. But the right. people who could not did, could, could not do that, they stayed for a while, but later they left. You know, because mm. because right. that's the way life is. We all are different people, right. and as long as we can realize that and appreciate mm -hmm. that, we can be successful. Right. But it's not like they were the bad guys and we were the good guys. <laughs> you know. Right. No. No. Why people do you think they, they couldn't hold uh, the, the, these people? Like, because you were telling me that some people mm -hmm. left. So why, why do you feel like they couldn't hold, you know, um, these type of people that were professional and talented? And No, they didn't. Lose. Some of the professional ones were the ones who stayed. You know, I oh really? Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay, they stayed. They okay. Stayed. Yeah. So the ones that left were more of who? Um, uh, I would just, and I'm just using my own opinion. It's just okay. people. Who, you know, people come with something. Everybody comes with it. You don't come with nothing. So whatever you come with, if you can develop that wherever you are, you're gonna stay. You know, if you Absolutely. can't develop what you come what you come with already naturally and what you've been doing, then you're gonna keep moving until you find that pace, that place, that space that that you can fit in. It's just a matter of humans, you know, and finding, as my girlfriend used to say, fit in, uh, get in where you fit in. So <laughs> you have, to have that mentality because everybody's not, can't grow in certain, you know, situations. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you can grow there and keep developing yourself, then humans, they, they move and gravitate into another place where they can be who they are and, and um, contribute to whatever they can contribute to. And that's a good thing. Yes. That's a good thing. Right. So, okay. So for those who don't know, the Islamic Party movement was also uh, based, well, they were in North America, right? DC, but they were also in South America as well, correct? At some point, yeah, they moved. And, and the ideology also, or should I say ide yeah, yeah. ideology changed too, because okay. <clears throat> basically it was, uh, as we call Sunni, whatever that is, 
uh, it was a Sunni, Sunni group and um, in the, um, uh, it's, I start because I was in a position where I can see different changes. Uh, then Gaddafi, I think, uh, I think socialism has a red book, is that correct? I believe so. Yes, yeah, socialism has a red book and Gaddafi had a green book. So I start seeing these little green books pop up. I said, uh oh, <laughs> what's going on? Oh, you start to I see the signs it. before the split. Yeah, this was before the split. So as okay. I read it, it reminded me so much of the red book. So I said, okay. So I just smiled because you don't know. You don't know how long it's going to take you, where you're going to go. So at any rate, um, by the time they actually moved out of D.C. and went to Atlanta, because that was the first place I was going, I had married the love of my life. <laughs> I need to hear about the love of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I had married the love of my life. I had three wonderful children uh, uh, of that marriage. Of that he loved. Oh, and he loved and respected my two boys, you know. My I boys from pre-Islam, Alhamdulillah. 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 We tried to have a good life. But anyway, um, <laughs> they at that point I, I had my you know, I had my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, they were you know, part of that, and other people that I knew were part of uh, that group. Mm-hmm. And um, um, and then you know the ideology changed, mm-hmm. and then the focus of not being in America no more and going to South America, they went back home. They, they couldn't, they couldn't do that, you know. Right. So they ended up going back home. And so did some others who couldn't uh, move in those directions. So right. they went wherever they went. So that was um a big split. And I think mm-hmm. um, and then people started living on the island and then they had their experiences there. And of mm-hmm. course, just like anything brand new, you talk about the islands, I mean you you know you're gonna have deal with something because you're not going to be in the same environment like America with America like the sewer system is in place and the this mm-hmm. is in place electricity you know we are so spoiled here but alhamdulillah we thank Allah for spoiling us but um mm-hmm. you know when you go to places like that you know you want you want to have something to go through but at the same time you know I always you know that adventure part of people always come out you know what an adventure I don't know what it was like but I would imagine that you know, the adventure of it was beautiful. You know, you're looking at different plants and trees and smelling smells and hearing things that you never heard before. I would imagine that it was a lot of good that came out of that for people, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, well, that's what happened. Like, uh, how did that affect you, the people in the community? Was it, I mean, what? Well, it's like any other split. You talk mm-hmm. about your friends. You know, you you carried your your baby the same time your buddy carried hers. Y'all exchanged mm-hmm. clothes together, baby clothes. Mm-hmm. You met each other when it was hard times. You know, you shared. So it's just like any other. You know, and that's what life is. Life goes on. Right. Um, right. Life just goes on, and that's just the way it is. You know. Right. Yeah, I understand. But you never accepted or even thought about considering the new change to Shiite? Um, was that ever? Um, yeah, that came up. Yeah. No, okay. because I was, but I told you, I was born by then. I was with the love okay. of my life. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I was talking to my buddies, but I was gone. I was in okay. Mississippi. <laughs> Oh, yes. You did say you was in Mississippi. That's right. So how was the place in Mississippi? How were the Muslims there? (laughs) I was on a college campus, so I couldn't, we didn't see Muslims. We didn't, you know, uh, uh, so it was like, uh, and that was new for me because I was always used to being around a community. So my spirit was like, we're going to have to be the community. But uh, I don't think that because uh, my husband had not experienced those kinds of things that I had, then that didn't come because, you know, if you, you had to have a certain spirit to say, we're going to do this, we're going to start a community, <laughs> you know, so right. my child, my we child. just tried to um, have mm-hmm. a good life for our children, you know, and um, as much as we could uh, show what Islam was uh, in our dawah, then we mm-hmm. tried to do that, you know, humbly. Mm-hmm. 
What a, let's talk a little bit about Ohio, Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, the community that you were a part of when you, while you were there. Imam Daoud, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Um, Hi. Hi. What masjid was this again? Uh, masjid Haq. Masjid Haq in Cleveland, mashallah. Yes, in mm -hmm. that community, um, they had the masjid, they had um, a hospitality suite. Uh, they had some apartments all around uh, the sides of it in front. So it was wonderful. That that close-knit, you know, inner circle kind of community, it, it was fantastic. It was a school there. We always had schools wherever, you know, we were. We always had schools. And um, that uh, paramilitary kind of a, a persona was there, you know. The, the what is it the black something rangers and all that they had some history back before they were muslim blackstone rangers and all that wow. i mean <laughs> so amazing they had, they had a rhythm that was deep <laughs> wow i love the spirit just spirit and the ah the position that the sisters played was phenomenal i had not been in a community where the sisterhood was treated like that sisterhood you mm -hmm. had sister hasina who was, um, alhamdulillah, she was just so blessed. And she was so talented in so many ways. You know, she knew how to be supportive to her husband, her community, her children, and her society. She was a very excellent role model. They had developed a school. The school had um, visited and spent some time in Africa. Uh, they came back and was trying to develop, uh, I think, another level of the school. So alhamdulillah, they went to Senegal on a trip. And that trip, I sent my oldest uh, to Senegal. They went to Bury Island and they uh, had good re relationships in, um, uh, with the people who were there. Sheikh uh, Asin Sisa, Sisi or Sisa, and, um, yes. and the community there. So they were grounded internationally as well. So um, that was a good experience. Um, some nice. uh, merchants who would uh, could teach you about buying, selling, and I mean, strategies, you know. Um, Mashallah. Just wonderful. Did you people. teach at that school as well? Uh, of course. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, by the mercy of Allah, yeah, we had a school there. And Sheikh Ma Masood, anybody know him? Probably know him. Uh, yes. He was one um, of the, yeah, he was one of the teachers there. Uh, uh, um, and it was, oh, uh, I can't see her name. He's the email manager. Yeah, out of Philly. Uh, she had a class also. And then I had a class. And, uh, of course, Sheikh Basu's class was, you know, top notch. <laughs> and my girlfriend's class, I loved her class because she taught, she was teaching us how to speak Arabic. So she told us in the beginning, do not bring those books and those pencils in my class. She said, because you'll never be able to speak writing everything down. And see, I was the write down person. I had learned from uh, the, the, uh, the rules of this and the rules of that. So while they are talking, speaking Arabic, I'm sitting there trying to conjugate my verbs and make sure my sentence structure was correct before I talk. But they were talking. <laughs> so that tells us another <laughs> thing that we need to learn how to do is what is your objective? Are you want to be a speaker of Arabic? If so, mm -hmm. take on her technique because Arabic is rhythm. And you hear the sound, you'll never forget the rhythm of that. Mm -hmm. I had a girlfriend of mine, I said she had gone to, um, uh, what was that place? Um, Iran, uh, during the uh, Iranian revolution. And uh, I said, when she came back, I said, teach me something. And she said, mm -hmm. do you hear the rhythm in that? Mm -hmm. You hear the rhythm? Language is rhythm. Mm -hmm. rhythm. And she taught me that. 30, 40 years ago, and I never forget it because I I, I, I didn't, uh, because I learned it through rhythm. So that's a key for us. And we need to keep that when we're trying to learn. Listen, and that's what my girlfriend was doing with the Arabic. She was telling us to listen. Listen to how I'm saying it, how long I'm saying it, mm -hmm. and then you'll get it. 
So mm -hmm. I'm telling you, rhythm is definitely in that bracket of techniques of learning uh, a language. Absolutely. Mario, hello. Mary was telling me that you are in a cobby. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to. Oh, yes. I'm still, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm still in the lobby. lobby. Did you wear any cobby? Y'all in my house now. So you both <laughs> in my house. I'm still in the cobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be fine. Yes. And that was wonderful. You want to know about that? Yes, yes. Tell us about your naqab days. Yes. Yeah. When I first saw it was in Philadelphia, there's one sister. And I remember we were talking and we were in a close quarters somewhere and, 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 and she said something about the naqab. I said to her, um, yeah, I would wear it, I said, if I needed to. And I don't know if I offended her or not when I said that. And uh, I said, I think I would wear it if I needed to. Because I looked at it as something that uh, was progressive. Most likely it would bring you closer to a law. Uh, it would make you make us more, you know, that closeness to a law. That's how I looked at it. When I saw it, that's what I saw. I didn't see looking like an Arab. I didn't see uh, trying to be something that you're not. I just saw positive. Well, I just let me look at it. And when I saw it, I liked it. It was pretty. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't think I needed it. But that was always me, right? But uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, years later, uh, when I couldn't focus good, I was so, I was conscious of things going around me. So I started getting unfocused. You know, I was too sensitive to negativity. I became very sensitive to it. And then that made me look towards it. And we find out in Islam, you don't never look towards anything that's negative. Always look to Allah, mm -hmm. you know, to Allah. And let him handle that. See, that ain't our hours to handle. Negativity is not hard. You handle the negativity in yourself, and mm -hmm. then you look to Allah to hold you there so you can learn whatever lesson that's happening in negativity world. But you ain't looking in negativity world and going in there trying to say, well, well, well why is this? No. Keeping your turn towards Allah, deal with yourself and ask Allah, since you showed me this negativity, please uh, show me the negativity in myself, mm -hmm. in myself, so I can learn how to not be or not ever become like that. So mm -hmm. the, the, the prayer that helped me because it narrowed it down. It narrowed down the whole thing. It narrowed down uh, what I can see and what I could not see. And it, it narrowed down the kind of people who were coming toward me to, you know, befriend me or whatever, because mm -hmm. the people who uh, uh, who were dealing with me were dealing with me. They wasn't dealing with, uh, oh, you got this veil on, oh, negative, negative, or, oh, you got this veil on, we love you, love you, love you. And it would always blow the Nakabi's mind when I wouldn't take the position that uh, I was doing something special because I had it on. You know, and I told one sister one time, I said, so is it me that you love or do you love my clothes? Mm -hmm. You know, so you had to think about that, you know, mm -hmm. because some people gather together because of the way you look. They don't gather and, and be with you because of the person that you are. So, oh, wow. um, yeah. so, and then the ones who didn't like it, who was browbeating, oh, trying to be an Arab and all that kind of stuff, you know, I just ignored them, you know. And was glad that uh, they wasn't in my world as long as they were in my world. We were in there just to say that good, bounce back, you know, because I don't need that. Be what you be, do what you need to do. Don't right. jump in my lane, stay in your lane. I so, love it. That's right. So, so the prayer to help me focus, that's what it was. Because I wasn't judgmental focus. So, you know, okay. men too. Men, if they know a woman is in the room, she can have a paper bag on her head. And if they know that that's a woman underneath that paper bag, they, 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 they who is she? Who is she coming from? She got the kids. <laughs> you know, so the prayer that helps is that even in, I won't say even, it, with men, it was a thing of respect. You know, they, they, they weren't trying to find out who was under the bag. They weren't trying to, uh do that underhanded stuff you know you mm -hmm. know they were basically most of them now some of them still have problems but um most of them were very very respectful and i appreciated that that 
you know, I'm your sister, you're my brother. That's good enough. You know, we, we can keep it just like that. And we can sure. be, yeah, yes. so it was a blessing and it is a blessing. Alhamdulillah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the DMV area, of Virginia. What led you? What led you to uh, move to that oh, area? Girl, that was was that Hodge? Yeah, Hodge that me to the DMV area because when I made Hodge, Alhamdulillah. What year uh, did you make Hodge? <laughs> gosh, <laughs> was this in the eighties, the nineties? Yeah, it was in the eighties. <laughs> in the eighties, oh, no. okay. <laughs> the first one, okay. The first Hodge was. The Maha time. So I need some of my Maha people to tell me what year that was. But okay. anyway, um, uh, Allah blessed me to make my Hajj, the first Hajj. And when I went there and I was going between Safa and Mawat, and I just looked over to where the Kaaba was, and I asked Allah to put me in an environment where I can learn his religion. You know, I really want to learn this deen, and I want to learn the language, you know, learn the deen. So right after Hodge, I was moving to Virginia. I had a, I had my car attached to the back of the U-Haul truck. I had my children in the front seat. seat. <laughs> and I was driving to Virginia to go to the Mahad. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the Mahad. You were telling me, but I, I, I need you to explain exactly what the Mahad is. Is. Yeah, the Saudi Arabian government set up a school in uh, in Virginia, and um, and that was for people to get their degrees. Mostly the Arabs would go there and get their degrees right here in America, and they open it up for the English speakers as well for the language. Okay. So I went there for the language, and um, something like it was excellent. I had a wonderful teacher. Uh, and she was American too, so we could ask her questions that probably we couldn't, would not be able to uh, ask uh, an Arabic speaker. So she was just wonderful. Uh, Alexandra Al uh, Ash, Al Ash, uh, excellent. She was a, um, a writer. She wrote books, um, translated books about the Sahabas, different Sahabas, just a wonderful individual and a good human being. It was something, you know, you're supposed to learn from the character of your teacher, you know. And she was one that I, I always respected and uh, I always respect and uh, I, I looked up to her and uh, she looked at the same, she had the same lens that we had in terms of America, being raised in America, she was American. And mm -hmm. um, trying to deal with this cultural thing that was going on, but at the same time, trying to be whoever you were, you know? So that was like, uh, mm -hmm. that was a jihad, trying to stay focused mm -hmm. and being in yourself. But that my heart was there. It was wonderful. We had some of the best teachers you could ever have. Um, wow. When we went, it was like, I think we went one day or either two days a week. And then I was there when they went full term. Uh, they went uh, daily, every day. So to go to the Mahad every day was just wonderful. You know, so mm -hmm. I was just, just entrenched in the language entrenched uh -huh. in the culture and language was it diverse did they have a lot of african-americans that went there as well oh like, goodness the... yes yes they took advantage okay. sisters in that area took advantage of that you know uh -huh. um, some noted uh -huh. sisters that uh, live in um, um maryland and dc and you know humbling they came to those classes humbling uh -huh. uh -huh. trying to learn uh, what other learn. communities were you a part of in the, in the virginia area Virginia? Okay. Mm -hmm. I taught Sunday school at uh, MCC. Okay. Um, uh, that was a good experience, too. Uh, one day I went there because I had heard about the classes there. And uh, I was just sitting on the bench. And one of the parents came out of, the, uh, came out of the, uh, one of the rooms and she said, oh, my goodness, our teacher didn't come yet. I don't know what I'm going to do with those kids, ch the children. So I said, I introduced her, my, myself. So I said, I'm a sister right here. I, I, I go to the Mahad. And I'm one of the students there. I said, if you like, I can uh, I can go in and take the class for the teacher until she returns. She said, okay, can you? So she marched me in that classroom. Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, um, the teacher, the teacher, Allah has blessed the teacher to be in the teachers. And you just do it. You take, you go in that room with a bismillah. You line yourself up, you set your class up in a way that you feel like uh, you can get something out of them. And then you get your boards together and then you start teaching. And uh, that's what I did. And I did that uh, until I 
um, what was that? I left there and went back to North Carolina because my mother was ill. Okay. So that was an excellent, because uh, we had a, um, that was the first time uh, that I saw African Americans playing a strong part in community life with foreign people. I had not seen that before, you know. Wow. Um, so we were appreciated there. And, and, uh, and I'm thankful that a lot gave us the opportunity to be there. Uh, I'm, uh, and some sure. wonderful people again came through there, you know. Sure. And got, um, so you didn't experience any type of uh, prejudices or anything like that from the sisters in that area? Like, not in that area, not in that area, but in, um, uh, it was, um, I lived in Reston. So Reston was like another world, but it was still Virginia. You know? okay. And in that, in that Reston part, you had people with a lot of money. And it's a tendency that when you're around foreigners with a lot of money, mm -hmm. you have to learn how to uh, navigate. And I was always like, here she comes again. <laughs> 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 and then I was in Perga. <laughs> I was in Perga, all black, from head to toe. And uh, they had to get used to me. You know, I had to get used to them, you know, and my right. shop also. MashaAllah, because I went back and down. You know, I knew my dean. I loved it. And I knew that whatever they were getting from me, you know, that I had to give back to them as well. Because how are we going to learn how to be sisters and brothers if we don't have this conflict that we have to work out? That's the reason why we have conflict. That's the reason why we have problems so that we can learn how to work things out. It's not because, oh, this person is so mad, bad, and this person, no. We have to learn that when we have opposition, that's one of the blessings of Allah, because if we learn how to work that thing out, it's something waiting over that rainbow that you can't even imagine Allah have such goodness for you, but you gotta mm -hmm. work it out. You can't be shouting at each other. You can't be cursing each other, telling people you're going to hell if you don't, you can't do that. We have to be um, with the law, holding the law's hand, and and asking them help me on it. I know I can't. I have no times, and it, it, where I had to actually take my fingers and do this. Stop talking to her. Don't say nothing else. Don't say nothing else. Don't pinch my tongue. <laughs> but that's what we have to do. Sometimes you got to pinch your tongue and be patient because it's not about us. It's not about. It's all about a law. Are we giving a law pleasure? Or, or are we making a lot sad about how we act? What are we getting a lot? It ain't about us. It's about a lot. It's not about us getting the last word, you know, or, you know, just letting you know, I just need to tell you this. You just need to know. It ain't about us. It's about how we're going to act in the middle of that situation that's going to please a lot. And most of the time is to stop talking. Don't say nothing. Powerful. SubhanAllah. Wow. Okay. Um anything else you want to talk about about the <laughs> <laughs> not the DMV, because I know you mentioned uh uh Muhammad Majid, who was a Sudanese teacher. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Faki from Howard University. How was Howard University back then? Was it oh, were you very oh, active? Howard, Howard was fun. That was fun. I was hanging out with <laughs> friends in Howard. Uh, that's where you see your uh, uh, prime, uh, Isha Prime, young, young uh, Isha Primes, mm -hmm. uh, young uh, Muhammad Majids, uh, young uh, uh, Jahari. These uh, were, these, yeah, these they were young, you know, yeah. something like, but still working and doing some great things, you know. So mm -hmm. um, it was wonderful. And then the students again, you know, the sisters, they were thinkers. They on Howard's campus. You got to think it out at that time. You, you might not have to do it now, but back mm -hmm. then you were thinkers, you know, you were trying to, you mm -hmm. out for the first time in your life, you know, mm -hmm. trying to become conscious. You're still in a conscious era and, uh, and then being Muslim. So that was, mm -hmm. and I have to talk about our, our dear beloved uh, uh, Alishiba. Shabazz. She was a pioneer, a revolutionary, and she brought all her wonderful spices uh, in the deed. She was the person that 
uh, if she had a movie, she did the program of the 100 woman, what was that one they had? They had the 100 man or something movement with Farrakhan. She did the one for the women. Wow. What's her name again? Alishiba Shabazz. Alishiba Shabazz. Okay. May Allah, heart, may Allah have mercy on her soul. She's left us now, but Alhamdulillah, mm. she was a soldier. She was a soldier. She comes out of, out of Philadelphia and D.C. Um, and she was part of uh, some organizations in Philadelphia where, um, uh, you know, they really wanted to get rid of that organization so much that they dropped a bomb on their house. But wow. anyway, um, oh wow, oh, like a literal know. bomb, like a real bomb. Oh yes, um, a real bomb. <clears throat> I heard a little bit about that. It's a panel. Oh of my God! Get the newspaper or something and read about that situation. I heard. <laughs> but I um, heard. I heard. she was a wonderful person. Uh, sure. She knew who she was. She loved her Africa. She loved her sure. African American. She loved her daddy. <laughs> she was always <laughs> good. She loved her grandmother. Sure. Uh, and um, she was very um, unique. Uh, mm -hmm. She was. She had cancer. Uh, alhamdulillah. And one of the times she had a bout with her cancer, and she was in the hospital. So. She said, Ty here, I was in the hospital and all of a sudden, alhamdulillah, Allah let me wake up. She said, I woke up and I saw all these sisters around my bed. One sister threw me out of the, uh, what she said, she threw it out of the shelter. Another one did this and another one did that. I told them all to get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. What you gonna do, watch me die? That's the kind of person Alicia by. She didn't play. And uh, oh. I asked the sisters that was there, I said, what y'all do with when she said that? She said, we got the hell up out of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, her, Allah, wow. She was a oh. spirit. Uh, I'm telling oh, you. Allah. Like that um, what, I wanted to talk a little bit about some um, organizations that you are a part of. Um, you mentioned a few of them. Can you talk a little bit about some organizations that you are part of? Oh, God. <laughs> what do you have on that piece of paper and I'll talk about it? Um, but you only talking about uh, Anissa. Oh, yeah, Anissa, Aliyah, Aliyah Abdul Kareem. May Allah have mercy on her soul. Beautiful soul, beautiful soul. Mm. Anissa, uh, um, Aliyah was one of those kind of people that when she met you, she never met a stranger. She'd have that conversation with you. She'd look at you and look like she was looking through you with a smile on her face. And then she tell you what you want to do. See, you into politics. You need to get with someone, someone, someone. And I want you to do X, Y, Z. And guess what? Everybody did X, Y. Whatever Leah told us to do, we did it. We didn't even know what we were doing, but <laughs> Leah told us to do it. And she came from a very, very um, uh, wonderful uh, beginnings too. Her past was wonderful too. She was an educator, you know, and she was a... Uh, um, um, uh, what is it, activist. And uh, she really wanted changes to happen among us. She loved her people to death and she wanted the best for us. You know, mm -hmm. she raised a, a princess of a, of a daughter, alhamdulillah. Uh, 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 Maya, the, another co-founder of BAM, she, Naima Kabir, she did an interview with um, Sister Aliyah's daughter. Uh -huh, and it was, it was a really beautiful um, interview that she did. And honor of her mom, I sure was. It was beautiful. Yes, yes. Beautiful. And she was a go getter. She used to work with um, Muslim Student Association. They were the, that was the thing um, that, back then. If the MSA. You, um, mm -hmm. if you were in the MSA and you went uh, part, if you were a part of them, then you would go on, on these speaking tours. Mm -hmm. And Aaliyah was on those speaking tours because she tried to make them understand that if you read a newspaper or a book and they put something in there in there that's not true about Islam and, and, and dishonoring Islam, you have to meet it. You have to meet it with, uh, uh, you know, some kind of apology. You better apologize that it wasn't like that. She right. tried to make them know that you can't sit on things because if you sit on things, the next thing you know, that's going to be you, whatever they put in these papers and whatever they put in these books. So she would go to different uh, communities, different places in America, and um, she would explain it. She kept her clippings uh, and, and all that, you know, so that people can see how that works. Mashallah. And I know when we went to visit um, 
the nation of Avon one year and when we were in Ohio, we went to their headquarters and in the hallway, it was- The nation of who? The nation of Avon. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, it's we like, okay, okay. Chicago. Okay. Yeah, we were okay. in Chicago and uh, we visited there and uh, with Far Farrakhan. And um, in the hallway, they had all these books and I just, it just took my eye and I kept saying, see there, they read everything. You have to read everything. You can't just read Muslim stuff and you have to read international stuff. You have to read stuff. You have, we have to be readers. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what we're gonna be in? La La Land, where everything is going on, we're gonna be in La La Land because we don't know what's going on around us. We have to know what's going on. You know, um, Absolutely. it's just. Yeah, but she um, was wonderful. So, and Mashallah. So what was uh what was Anissa about? What was the, the Anissa um, was about women empowering women, you know, with this thing. You know, we have things that we want to get done. We have agendas that we think is good for us, you know, and we need strong enough women that's gonna stand out there and get the job done. And it had moved uh to Africa. We had one sister that was from Africa that was with the group as well. So um the Just Gambia, kind of, huh? The Gambia, Gambia. yes. The Gambia. I've been there yeah. before. <laughs> but uh, Beautiful you know, people, yeah. Yeah. Just basically trying to get women out of this mindset, um, uh, or in the mindset that we are important. We are Khadijas. You know, she was important. Her role was important. Our role is important, mm -hmm. and try to get us to come together in. Um, uh, motivate motivate each other so we can be a motivation to the brothers in our communities as well you know sure. um, so Somebody she was there. and those sisters there uh gosh some sisters out of new jersey and out of new york oh my mm -hmm. goodness you talking about sisterhood baby 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 sisters, sisterhood but you got to be doing something together to get it like you all are doing you all are learning things about each other that you didn't know, and you're boosting each other's um, morale and keeping yourself going. That's mm -hmm. all we're doing. Try to get with people with like minds mm -hmm. and try to give solutions and to better ourselves and our oh. community. And make our role as women a strong role, not a passable role sitting on the side. Yes, we have a voice, and we're going to stay within the contents of Islam with this voice, and we're going to try to make things better. You know, mm -hmm. Marion Funches was like that too. She was out of Philadelphia and she was one of the ones who started uh, one of the organization, organization um, mm -hmm. oh Lord, they are gonna kill me if I can't say the name of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, well, anyway, she was instrumental in getting Muslim women groups together uh, mm -hmm. to come together and be uh, a, a body of um, positive force. What's her last name again? Punches, may Allah have mercy on her I mean, soul. She, I mean, Punches was a, she wasn't no joke. You know, she had a lot of ideas. She had a lot of things that was pushing her. She was mm -hmm. in this one party also. Um, okay. Um, okay. Mashallah. Fantastic. Her, uh, oh, girl, mm -hmm. just sisterhood. Every time you think about the sisterhood, it was just. Wow. Fantastic. It's beautiful. As a child of a, of a community activist, women like you and the, sister leah's and it's like you guys were our role models you know i, I don't want to start crying because i said i was gonna cry on this life but mashallah we love you guys and we appreciate everything that you guys have done and inshallah oh. we could we can be able to continue on the you legacy are. You are. <laughs> the, uh, man, continue to bless you all make it easy for you and accept i mean, I, mean. I have a question <laughs> though um I want to hear about this love story, right? In a time where divorce is, is rampant and we're in a quote unquote marriage crisis, right? It's so good to hear about an old school love story. <laughs> Can we hear a little bit about your love story? You said that he was the love of your life, sister. To hear it. We need to hear it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we did divorce though, but he was oh, okay, okay. the love of my life. <laughs> he was. Oh, good he well, Yeah. And he came right at the right time because I really felt like I was being rescued, you know, because that was the time when uh, the Islamic party was going through a whole lot of changes mm -hmm. um, from different directions. 
And uh, his brother, what is this? His brother was a member of the Islamic party. And what he would say to me, oh, I'm gonna get you married to my brother. And I said, oh man, get out my face, you know? And it was good to watch to see him another time. He was so much fun. He reminded me of Cosby. He was a Cosby kind of a personality. Okay. And, uh, that was our joke. That was our joke, Jose. So sure. eventually he did. He, um, he said, well, my brother's going to be coming down and I want you, you all to meet. And uh, I've already talked to him about you. And I said, look at this man. What is he doing? So we did talk and uh, I really love, we did uh, uh, feel, feel like we could try to make this work, you know, because mm -hmm. he had not been around communities where I had been. Uh, he had not been in the Dean even as long as I had, but okay. um, he felt like uh, he could learn something in marrying uh, me. So I said, okay. well, I'm really not. You're a um, knowledgeable woman in the community. <laughs> um, uh, you are a knowledgeable woman in the community. So, mashallah. <laughs> She's trying to be knowledgeable. Trying, striving, <laughs> right? Striving, mashallah. Striving, striving, hoping, striving. Yeah. Um, so, it was at a good time for me. You know, that's okay. I, like I was being rescued, really. I did. So, that was that night in, in shining armor for me. You know, mm -hmm. although we know that in marriage, <laughs> you know, you right. don't have to that thing out and you gotta have some gumption mm -hmm. and you have to have that handhold holding on to a bar. You have to have, because this is the thing where Shaitan comes in when he has a big meetings and a person who has separated a family, mm -hmm. torn a family apart, he gets the biggest raves and applause in the assemblies of the gym, mm -hmm. you know? So we have to, we try to remember things like that when we are bickering. Because in the room, it's not him and you and y'all fighting and, and just you, him, and the shaitan. So we don't give the shaitan his work. So when we in these rooms with each other and we're discussing things and we're trying to uh, get over whatever our differences is, both parties have to be continuously shooing him out. So if you see him over the wife's shoulder, say, oh, the balahi bin shaitan, get him out the room, you know. If the wife see him over the uh, uh, the husband's shoulder, shoo him out the room. Say, instead of looking at each other and cursing each other, we have an avowed enemy in that room. So, but we forget it when we are up against each other with an idea or something that we feel and what, whatever, all that kind of stuff. We have to stop doing that because, um, that's the not that's not the way we have to do it. But at any rate, we tried, we tried, and uh it, we thought at the end it might be better to just go ahead on because at least we were speaking and being civil. In fact, my mother said, the way y'all did that, that divorce thing, that was something I have never seen before. Yeah. You know. So she saw it in the way we split up as something good. She didn't see uh the slander and the gossip and the pulling your hair and all that kind of stuff. You know, because we were raising children that hopefully by our example, uh, it would be an example for them because you cannot, sometimes you're not going to be able to get along, but even though you were not able to get along mm -hmm. and divorce is part of our religion, you could do that peacefully. MashaAllah. Absolutely. <laughs> um um, let's talk a little bit about the conferences that you spoke in, the sisters' conferences. Oh, those sisters. Oh, my goodness. Which one first? Them sisters in Richmond. Oh, the Richmond Virginia. Sisters. <laughs> and oh, those sisters there. They dynamite. They straight up, straight up, you know, and they would have plays and stuff that they would do to have us laughing out of our chairs because they were trying to make a point about something. And whatever the, the point that they were trying to make, they made it really dramatic and they had us laughing, but at the same time learning. Um, I pray that they have their conferences again because the COVID stopped them from, from doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And the sisters in um, uh, Baltimore, them mm -hmm. sisters there, they, they are tigers. They're tigers. You got to move back with them sisters in Baltimore because they tigers. <laughs> They'll try to get you. So you got to move back, <laughs> give them their little space, but you can't be no punk. You can't be no punk with no them. <laughs> 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 the ball, the ball. Oh, oh, but I tell you what, 
they have scholarship that I have never seen before. And I know you had Isla on. Isla has been a part of the group. Oh, she's next week, top. inshallah, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, you haven't had it yet? No, it's not yet. <laughs> on top. When you give your presentation and stuff, you got to have your stuff in order. Where are you getting this from? How to get that? Da, 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 da. You are going to get up there and say, I feel, I think, you know, mm. uh, you're not doing that. You're mm. going to have to have something that you turn in to let them see where your um, your references come from. Mm-hmm. And, um, and alhamdulillah. So I've been in some nice conferences with all those sisters. The New York sisters, they haven't mm-hmm. had this in a while either. And uh right. that, Nimble. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So humbly love. Mm-hmm. It was just wonderful working with those sisters. And I hope they get there. Um I think one is the Baltimore one is gonna is coming up already. So if yeah. you have your tickets, get your tickets. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. We know that Islam is a journey, and uh, as we take this journey our understanding and our implementation of, of the Dean changes, right? Yes, uh, what are some things that you've learned in your journey, in your, in your, in your life, in your, in your Dean? Um, okay, the biggest thing is Salah. We will be working on our Salah to the day we die and we still ain't gonna get it right. Salah, because that's our communication with Allah. If we keep that communication going with the law through our salat, we'll see the straight path. We'll know what it is and we'll see it because we're working with two entities. We're dealing with what we can actually see with the eyes and we're dealing with the heart. The heart and the body have to be consolidated. Call it bin Salim, a peaceful heart, where the heart is doing what it's supposed to do, commanding its, uh, its limbs commanding its its thinking, commanding its hearing, commanding its sight. The heart has to be in control. In fact, the law said, that's mine. That ain't yours. That heart that you got in there is mine. And what he does is he holds on to a rope. It's like a rope. He holds on to one side of it and we'll hold it on it on the other side. That rope is the Quran. That rope is the Quran. So if we are not in a custom to reading the Quran on a daily basis, we setting ourselves up. Our salat can't be but so good if we're not reading the Quran. Our relationship with the Quran is our relationship with the law. So if we're not picking it up, trying to understand it and trying to read it and do tadabar, which is the contemplation of it. You read it, you, you know something, you said it, you know something of it, but it has to reach the heart. When the Quran reaches the heart and enters the heart, we are believers. We are believers. We are Muslims. Oh, you know, we believe in the law. We took our shahada. We believe with all our heart and soul. But faith has to enter the heart. When it enters the heart, then we become these transformed people that I, uh, Aisha already Allah said, my husband, my prophet Muhammad Islam, is a walking Quran. That's who he is. That's what we have to become. But we have to give the Quran its due. And as we approach this month of Ramadan, which is the month that celebrates the uh, the coming of the Quran on this planet Earth and go through the process of the angel, go through the process of Prophet Muhammad and him teaching us this message, you know, we have to really keep in mind of this miracle. This is a miracle. And we are living the miracle when we practice this theme. We living miracles. We live in it, we practice it. And the Salat, we can't make it without the Salat because we won't be able to have an inner eye. We don't have a, a spiritual eye without the Salat. So even when you're making that Salat and you, something come up in your mind, you say, oh gosh, go back to the last place that you remember where you were remembering. Start saying that prayer. Start trying to get rid of stuff out of your mind and stuff before you get to the prayer. Get some sleep, get some food, do something in order to boost our strength because we can ready to make a lot now. Ex- <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm sorry, my camera had went off. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so as we wrap up, as we wrap up, inshallah, I have a few questions. What mistakes can we learn from 
uh, like the earlier generations? What mix, what mix, what mistakes can my generation and the generation that's after me learn from uh, the earlier generations? Inshallah, as to not repeat mm -hmm. itself. What do you think is some things that um, we can do differently? What you're doing right now? See, you're reaching back. That's history. When you reach back, then you learn from the people that you talk to. You know, if you take another step, you're going to fall off that hill. You know, you get that kind of um, um, understanding from people who have come before you. So you're doing the right thing now. Get, just learn from what the mistakes that other people made. You, some, of them will, some of it will be apparent. And then others will be like in an interview like this, where you get kind of, you try, kind of, well, I don't want to know about this little thing here. How did that thing work? And that kind of thing. So you get it that way too. If we remember where we were back in our history and don't make those same kind of mistakes, you could make the next step, you know, but for sure, for sure, for sure, we have to know Allah. We have to know him, not just in the head. I know who Allah is. He's not that um, statue over there. He's not the moon and the stars. That's a good place to be. We have to know him. And that means when we cry out, when we go through whatever uh, changes we go to, and in everybody's life, whether they, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, it's always going to be a time in your life that when you look around, nobody's going to be there. Help! It's that stage of help, help, and nobody hears, nobody helps. Only Allah hears. So when we get into that state where we're saying help like that, Allah will reveal himself to us. When he reveals himself to us, never let go. Never let go. Don't get on the shore and say, and when somebody said, oh, girl, it was a, a, a rowboat coming to pick you up. You should have known that. No, that was your respect, your, your relationship with your Lord. It comes in prayer and it comes in that help, help. No money, no food, no this. You just, in that help stage, Allah will reveal himself to you. And once you know who Allah is, you hold, hold, hold. No matter what happens, you hold on tight. Because again, we can't do nothing without Allah. And That's our right. heart has to be in it. Our hearts have to know him. Mm -hmm. Before we see him in the hereafter, our hearts have to know. Mm -hmm. So we always ask him, Allah, help us, help us. Strive, don't be, because you're not going to be. We don't know what we are until we get into the hereafter. The only Absolutely. thing we do here is make the effort and always be talking to Allah. Oh, Allah, did I get that right this time? Did I mess up on that? Get up at night and pray and try to get that extra uh, spiritual uplift, you know, mm -hmm. and, and keep it keep it right with Allah. Right. You can say to Allah, oh, Allah, I'm so tired. I don't know what to do. Give mm -hmm. it to Allah. Don't give it to other people. The way we talk to other people is the way we should be talking to Allah. Oh, Allah, this is getting really heavy. I don't know if I can get up for Fajr Salah. I, my, my legs not moving. Talk to Allah, you know, mm -hmm. and He'll make those legs move and get mm -hmm. up. Yes. What are some things that you're proud about about the Black American Muslim community, like where we're at now, or just in general, like? Um, is it Tara? It's frozen. I think it's frozen. Sister Tahira. Oh yeah, I think it is frozen. It's frozen? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. And we were kind of just kind of wrapping up too. Alhamdulillah. Maybe she'll come back on. Um just for a few minutes. Inshallah. Um, Sister Tahira definitely said that she wanted. Um, to open up the floor, but I don't think that we have time tonight. <laughs> but uh, I think that we can kind of work on doing an, another program or live um, where uh, she can come back and you guys can talk to her <laughs> and ask her questions because she really wants to hear from our generation. She wants to hear from the youth now. And so that would be awesome if we can have like a Q and A session with okay. Sister Tahira. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I'm proud. I'm proud when I. Uh, I'm. I'm thankful for the Black African American Union. I'm thankful uh, that we're still here, and mm -hmm. uh, that we're still striving. 
I want you all to be just a little bit stronger in your presence. You have wonderful things. You have all this wonderful stuff in your head. You know, I want to see, I want to hear your visions. I want to see your visions in, 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 in the reality of life. You know, we want to see that flower, you know, because you all are these gifts, these flowers. And I'm not seeing you all enough. You know, mm -hmm. I want to know you. You know, we walk past mm -hmm. each other. There's old sister Ty here, alhamdulillah. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, but when I see you all, I want to know you. I really want to know you all. And uh, and if it's one thing I can say or 20 things I can say uh, to try to boost you all so you can just be in bloom, just stay in bloom, stay in bloom and be seen as the beauty, beautiful people that you are. Allah has just blessed this African-American. I'm not saying nothing about the other folks, but he has put something in us that is just wonderful mm. who in the world could look at a person and love a person when they've done so many things to us that's something a lot put there it's no way in the world we could have done that it's no way in the world that we can look at people mm -hmm. and respect them and like them and mm -hmm. see the good in them mm -hmm. and know all the things that they were capable of doing to us as African Americans. I don't think nobody else could do that. That's why Allah chose us. I really believe that. This, this whole experience for us to see, show people what mercy is, to show people what love is, to show people how Allah uses one group against another group and they still stand on their feet. That's the thing that's driving them crazy. We have done everything to these people. They say in that you know, the law when we had laws that said, don't teach them how to uh, uh, read. We will kill you if you teach them how to read. They have done everything. And then when I say they, I mean the people who shaitan influences. So let's get, now don't get too caught up on that other day because that's real too. But one of the things I love about my people is that Allah chose us for the task that we are still manding, Allah is still allowing us to, uh, um, to be a symbol of peace, you know. Mr. Tahira, what, do, what advice do you have for the Muslim parents now that are raising um, these Muslim kids? <laughs> get in their world, get in their world, get in their world, and don't be critical. Get in there first and then try to find some good ways to be critical. But get in their world, let them be whoever they are, let them have the experiences, and uh, then drop little nuggets. Don't be like me. And uh, I would try to say everything at the same time. One of my children said, just give me a beating. But you're going to lecture me? Don't lecture me, please. Just give me the beating. I say, no, son, I'm not going to uh, beat you. You're going to sit down and listen to what I have to say. So I'm telling you, it really helps to be empathetic with your children. It helps more than teaching them a whole lot of rules and regulations. Rules and regulations uh, can stay uh, uh, in your face. They'll practice the rule and regula regulations, but when you're not in the mother's face, then those rules and regulations go down the drain. Yes, they got to hear them, but that getting into their world, meeting them where they are, Oh, I don't know if I'm a boy or girl, mama. Don't go crazy. You know, we know that that's, is, you know, what that is. Get with them. Go eye to eye and toe to toe and heart to heart with them. And then uh, just say, and ask along, give me that nugget along. Please give me that nugget. Don't let me do it because I know I'm going to mess it up. You have to realize that we will mess it up. Ask along for the nugget. Hold on, give me the nugget. Give me the word I'm supposed to say here. And I know I can't see a whole lot. So give me those nuggets that I need. If it's one word, say the one word. I love you can be a good one, uh, first step. So they don't feel like now you uh uh now you you're gonna take what is that? I uh oh gosh, at nighttime I'm telling you I can't have words, but uh, alhamdulillah, um you you letting them know that. I still have the same connection with you that I've always had. I'm not judging you. 
And we have to learn that just like Allah met us where we were, we have to meet our children where they are. Even if they were in the market all their lives and those 50 swords from the Quran, how many of those 50 swords went in their heart? Because that's where the change comes. It has to go in the heart. We just can't be lit. We have to beg Allah. These are words that, these are your words. And these words, when I say them, I beg you Allah to let these words enter into my heart. That's the change. Everything changed after that. So we have to let it our children know that we in it with them. We love them, nothing has changed and beg a law for the nuggets, beg them. He'll put something for you to say. He'll put an example for you to give them and back off because they got a, they have parents, they have, they're, they're growing. Mm -hmm. So if they get one part of what you're saying, alhamdulillah. And then the next part, alhamdulillah until they get to where they need to be or where Allah has already decided where they're going to be. We can't make that decision. We just have to be good listeners and empathetic and loving parents and stop judging them. Allah is the judge, not us. Alhamdulillah. Where would you, um, what do you see us uh 10, 15 years from now, what would you like to see for the for the Black American Muslims here in America? i like you to uh, be in every aspect of social life, every aspect of it, being the positive of it. So when people go to these different rallies and stuff like that, most of that stuff is political. Don't think for a minute that that's changing things. That's somebody political agenda. Do not be reactionary. That's what we were in the 60s for the most part. Somebody did something, let's break down the houses, let's burn it down. You know, don't be reactionary. I would like for you as Muslim to be in every aspect of social life, making a difference. Even if you go to the move, uh, the, the, um, uh, the meetings and you say one good word, go to the meeting, say the one good word, and politely leave if they are gonna carry on with some other conversation, politely leave. Musa is the example of what I would love for you all to be. He was around the worst person that, we, that was described to us in the Quran. You know, the worst society that we know about next to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know. So, and even with him, the, that, the prophet was Sodom and Gomorrah, his example. To the very end, when they were knocking his, his door down, trying to get to the angels, they didn't know they were angels. He was saying, take my daughters, you know, don't, don't, don't keep doing what you're doing. This is, this is something that is horrible and our creator doesn't like this. You know, take my daughters, but don't go with men like that. He was still trying to figure out a way that he could help them stop doing uh, the practices of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Musa was the same way in terms of trying to be the biggest example, uh, how he stood up to power. How he stood up to power is I hope that that would be the way you are. Using that pen, using uh, your penmanship, using your voice, and most of all, using your example. That's why Subhanallah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the best of that. He, you know, he told us stuff, but his personality was the thing that swayed people over. One man looked in his face and said, that's not the face of a liar because they were trying to get him to not go and speak and be a part of the religion of Islam. All he had to do is look in his face. So if we can understand that our character is one, one, it's needed. We have to have character. So I want you all to just establish good character and Allah will carry you places and help you develop all kinds of things and help all kinds of situations, just having a good character. Probably not. Alhamdulillah. Well, Sister Hit to hear is Shakran. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much you. for um, agreeing to come on. Um, thank you for your wisdom, for your experience. Oh, and inshallah, everybody that has been listening has been taking heed, right? Inshallah. Mm -hmm. We got work to do. And may Allah give us the tools that we need to continue to do the work that's needed to be done. Yes. Inshallah. So alhamdulillah, everything, may Allah bless everything that was said here, whatever good is from Allah and whatever, you know, 
wasn't correct. It's from Shaitan. So alhamdulillah. But this was a really amazing interview. I learned a lot and I feel inspired. <laughs> alhamdulillah. So I want to say thank you so much. And we appreciate you and we love you. And thank you for everything that you've done for um uh setting us, you know, establishing this dean in, in America and set an example for all of us. So alhamdulillah, I appreciate you and thank you so much. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Miriam, for lending your mom to us. <laughs> so we're going to close. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and we're going to close. Inshallah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, y'all. Bye. Let me end it.